Chapter 231. Something Obvious. 1. Kale headed back to a corner room on the third floor of the old inn. He left Ron outside the door and had Rayon immediately connect the call. Human. Are we going to fight against that slightly crazy bastard today? There's no need. However, contrary to what he was saying, Kale's expression did not look good. He recalled the battle in the Karo Kingdom. He had suffered significantly because he had trusted Klopa's comments about how the dragon half-blood was weak. Just thinking about that made him want to forget about working with the Parun Kingdom and instead just smashing them apart. Crackle. Crackle. He watched as the screen floated above the video communication device and waited for Klopa. He had made up his mind to give Klopa a piece of his mind. Kale Nim. However, Kale became anxious once the call connected. First of all, don't clasp your hands like that. Klopa appeared on the screen with his hands clasped as if he was praying toward Kale. I had a feeling you would be uncomfortable with this, Kale Nim. Klopa Seka lowered his hands as he sat there with a calm expression. In return, Kale's expression turned extremely odd. He looks fine, but he's a total loony. Kale Nim, the reason I called. Hold on. Kale cut Klopa off and asked. I've been curious about this for a while, but why do you keep calling me Kale Nim? Your position is higher than mine. Just call me young master like everyone else. People will think it is weird. It was fine for Choi Han to call him, Kale Nim, since he had done so from the beginning, however, Klopa Seka could not call him that, especially thinking about how they would work together in the future. Kale thought that Klopa would understand the meaning behind his words. I cannot do that. Kale Nim is not just a young master or a commander. Kale Nim is the G. Stop. Kale felt as if he should not hear what Klopa would say next. He didn't want to hear that word that started with A, G. Kale held back his sigh and continued to speak. Why have you been quiet all this time and just now giving me a call? Klopa could see that Kale was looking at him with a cold gaze even though his voice was calm. It had been much longer than one week since Kale had the whale tribe strike the Parun Kingdom's northern patrol stations. Kale had given them one week, however, the Parun Kingdom had not contacted him until now. Why did it take them so long to respond? Klopa smiled after seeing that Kale was still calm without any signs of anger nor uneasiness. I could not come empty-handed. Kale started to smile. I knew this guy's head worked well. Yes, you can't come empty-handed to make a deal. The Karo Kingdom's battle. The Parun Kingdom had realized that they needed a new source for survival other than the Indomitable Alliance after seeing the results. They also knew that the Rhone Kingdom was the one who would give them an alternative path for survival. Screech. Kale leaned back onto the old chair and motioned toward Klopa with his chin. He was telling Klopa to show him what the Parun Kingdom had brought after such a long time. I will decide after I see what you brought. Kale and the Rhone Kingdom had the upper hand and could make up their mind afterward. Klopa had to stop the corners of his lips from going up. I knew I was right. The path to a legend. Klopa had felt chills throughout his body after hearing about the Karo Kingdom's battle. Hearing about the appearance of the Dark Elves and how Kale's shield had defended against the Light Arrow was electrifying. He knew that Kale would have underestimated Arm's Mage after his unintentional misinformation. Even then, Kale managed to defeat a formidable foe who suddenly appeared. That was what a hero, no, what a legend should be able to do. The White Snake could see a path to survival in Kale. That was why he had done everything he could in order to prepare this for him. The Indomitable Alliance is currently barely managing to hold on. It was obvious. They had been destroyed in both of the major battles. But they cannot retreat just like this. Arm, which has somehow become the central figure of the Alliance, is pushing for a final stand. Arm's final stand. Kale could easily imagine where the location of this battle would be. He thought about two different people. Rosalyn, who had thrown away her position as a princess in order to focus on being a mage, and Locke, who would end up walking the path of the Wolf King. He was thinking about the Breck Kingdom where the two of them currently were, as well as the Gorge of Death within the Breck Kingdom. The final battle will be at the Gorge of Death. Klopa could no longer stop himself from smiling. It was because Kale's expression was one of someone who already knew about it. As expected, Kale Nim's foresight is amazing. It is fitting for someone who will become a legend. Klopa. Kale quickly cut off the crazy bastard's nonsense. He then observed the white-haired guardian knight, Klopa Seka, who was looking at him. Currently, 
Only the Rhone Kingdom and a few of the Paran Kingdom's people knew about Klopa's whereabouts. The rest believed that he was currently missing or that he had been killed in the Henatus territory. That was why there were many uses for him. Kale slowly started to speak. If it was you, with the weakened indomitable alliance, no, let me put it differently. Kale's side will naturally be the ones to win the battle at the Gorge of Death. The winning side can enjoy their victory. But what about the losers? The strength of the three kingdoms in the north will be dismal after they lose at the Gorge of Death. The Parun Kingdom, Askausan, and Norland will all be weak after the battle. Wouldn't the weakened north be easy prey for someone? Was there anything easier than swallowing up a weakened enemy? Kale might be wrong, however, why would Arm spend so much resources in order to have the Indomitable Alliance prepare for a final battle? Maybe Arm realized that they would not be able to take any of the southern lands through the Indomitable Alliance and were instead thinking about taking the northern lands instead. The Lion Tribe, Bear Tribe, and the Flame Dwarf Tribe probably all want their own territories. In that case, would they want the difficult to acquire southern lands or the easy to take northern lands? The answer was obvious. Klopa Seca, the enemy is within your ranks. Kale was giving Klopa and the Paran Kingdom a warning. It was at that moment. He he he. Kale could see Klopa Seca suddenly starting to laugh like a maniac. He he he. Kale Nim, you really are. He he he. What is wrong with him? Kale's pupils started to shake. It seemed as if Klopa was getting crazier even though all he said was to be wary of arm. Kale slowly tried to move away from the screen. Human, this guy is not just slightly crazy. Kale and the six years old dragon had the same thought. Klopa started to speak at that moment. Kale Nim, we are prepared. Prepared. The person who had been laughing like a maniac had returned back to normal. Kale's expression was still iffy, but his expression changed after hearing what Klopa had to say. We have prepared a route to invade all the way to Askausan and Norland's palaces. What? Kale flinched. He then observed Klopa. Klopa still had a calm expression his face, however, his eyes were glowing. We have prepared the shortest route from the Parun Kingdom in order to take down both Askausan and Norland. We have also installed a large-scale teleportation magic circle in the Parun Kingdom's knight's training ground. That is the reason we were a bit late. There was something that Kale had missed until now. Klopa Seca was the crazy person who had waged war against the continent in order to make himself into a legend. He had already been crazy. He was someone who would do anything and figure out everything necessary in order to achieve his goals. I plan to offer that route to the Rhone Kingdom. No, I offer that route to you, Kale Nim. Klopa slowly started to smile. You mentioned that arm may aim for the northern kingdoms, right? Klopa Seca. He knew very well that the true symbol of his household was a white snake. It was because that was his personality as well. However, he had strong feelings about being a person from the Parun Kingdom. Why? The Parun Kingdom's royal family and leaders were the ones who had turned this white snake household into the Guardian Knight household. They too had felt strongly about being citizens from the Parun Kingdom for similar reasons. A bright smile settled on Klopa's face. Kale Nim. That action that Arm may or may not take. That is our Parun Kingdom's specialty. He was talking about being the hidden enemy within the Alliance. The Parun Kingdom was confident that they could do it as well. We just have to do it before Arm makes their move. No, Kale Nim, you, and the Rhone Kingdom can do it first. The Parun Kingdom had found a route for survival and was offering this as part of the deal. Kale honestly responded back to Klopa, who was on the other side of the screen. You crazy bastard. Ha ha ha, don't I need to move quickly in order to keep up with a legend? Kale sternly responded to Klopa who was now laughing. Put your dad on the line. He felt as if he needed to talk to someone sane right now. Kale chose to chat with Duke Rock Seca instead of Klopa. The call soon ended. Kale brushed his face with both hands. Weak human. Will the Rhone Kingdom control the entire north? Do you think that is possible? Kale scoffed at Rayan's comment, however, he felt chills at the back of his neck as well. But according to that white-haired father-son duo, although we may not be able to take their hand, wouldn't the Rhone Kingdom be able to threaten the three northern kingdoms? Kale could not respond to Rayan's question this time. In the end, he opened the room door with an ominous feeling. Click. The door opened and he could see Ron who was standing guard. He then sternly spoke to Ron who was looking at him. 
I will be heading back to the western continent for a bit. I will be back in a month, so you know what to do, right? Ron understood exactly what Kale was getting at and responded back. I will prepare a plan to eat up the Lieb and City's underworld. One month should be the perfect amount of time to plan for the opening of the inn as well. Ron truly was reliable. Kale looked toward the dragon standing next to Ron. The ancient dragon casually responded back. I will look for another dragon while you are not here. I'm sure that you need to learn about the history of Lieb and City. Thank you very much. The ancient dragon stepped up in order to figure out the secrets behind the history of the city. Kale gave a short thank you before using the teleportation magic circle to return to the western continent's super rock villa with the children averaging nine years old. Kale finished his preparations at super rock villa before moving elsewhere. He was wearing a clean black uniform. The teleportation soon completed and Kale's sight returned. Your Highness. Crown Prince Alberu Crossman, he could see him in the distance. This was a secret teleportation magic circle inside the palace. Kale had used this to stealthily enter the palace. Kale started to speak in reflex as soon as he saw the crown prince's face. You are as fancy and passionate as the rising sun as usual. Kale stopped talking. He quickly returned to his usual voice as he continued to speak. Your Highness, I know this is going to sound terrible, but what's wrong with your face? Did something happen? Alberu Crossman. His face was a total mess. He seemed tired from being stuck in the middle of a bunch of annoying things. The way he was standing as he greeted Kale seemed a bit desperate as well. Is there something for me to do again? Kale started to get a bad feeling again. Kale Henatus. Alberu was not using the title of commander and instead was using his name for the first time in a long time, however, there was no energy in his voice. Kale started to consider teleporting right back. It was at that moment. Alberu started to speak in the most serious voice he had ever used. You only seem to have people that cause headaches around you. Excuse me? People that cause headaches? Ah. Kale quickly understood what he meant. Alberu was talking about the people who had been staying in the capital while Kale was in the eastern continent. Choi Han, Mary, and Hillsman. Kale nodded his head. Yes, I'm sure His Highness found the terrible actor Choi Han and the innocent Mary to be hard to handle. For someone like Alberu, who found it difficult to handle even the Karo Kingdom's crown prince, Valentino, Choi Han and Mary must have been extremely difficult. Kale had a good understanding of it. I guess Choi Han and Mary are really difficult to handle. One was too stiff and terrible at acting while the other was too innocent and nice. Kale could see crown prince Alberu scoffing at his response. Your meaning of, difficult, is quite surprising. Excuse me. Never mind. It's nothing. Alberu shook his head. He then turned around and started to walk, making Kale follow behind him with a confused expression. He heard Rayan's voice in his head as he walked. I knew Choi Han's smile was weird. What is he talking about? Kale looked at Alberu's back as they headed out of the secret underground room. He heard Alberu's voice at that moment. You seem to be someone who is quite loved. Are you really sick, Your Highness? You have suffered quite a bit. Just what was going on? Kale did not understand Alberu's words as he continued to follow behind him. Click. Alberu opened the door heading back to surface and they appeared in a room. It was Alberu Crossman's new office. It was the same one he would use once he became king. The office was full of papers. Kale heard someone's voice as he took a step back in disgust. Young Master Kale. Kale looked toward one of the walls. A screen from a video communication device was taking up an entire wall. Long time no see, young master Kale. He could see a face through the video communication device. It was someone whose beautiful red hair was different than Kale's in that it resembled the sun in the middle of the day. Rosalind. She greeted Kale with a smile. Kale smiled back and greeted her as well. Long time no see, Miss Rosalind. She smiled again and asked a question. The Indomitable Alliance is heading down in two days? Yes. Rosalind's smile became even wider after hearing Kale's short response. We will get to see all of them, the bear tribe, the lion tribe, and the dwarves? Of course. The flame dwarf tribe made devices for them to cross the gorge of death? Correct. Rosalind, who was wearing a robe over her leather armor, pushed the corners of her lips back down with her fingers. A battle against the indomitable alliance. Although she did not wish for it to happen, a part of her had been longing for this moment. 
she had stayed at the Brecht Kingdom even when her friends were fighting in the Rhone Kingdom and the Karo Kingdom. She did not contact them via video communication device either. It was partially because she believed they would win, however, there was one main reason. Rosalind. She knew that there was royal blood flowing in her body. The blood of a king. Although she had thrown away her position as a princess, the blood still flowed through her. That blood was making her angry right now. The blood of a king could not forgive those who aimed for their territory. It was for the Breck kingdom and her family, as well as for the people who were precious to her that were coming to help the Breck kingdom out. It was so that she could protect all of them with her own hands. It was also so that she could relieve her anger against those who were aiming for her land. Rosalind had been training to become stronger with Kale's help. She was happy knowing that the time that she had been waiting for was near as she asked Kale a question. Will the enemy be able to get past the Gorge of Death? Rosalind could see Kale starting to smile. What an impossible imagination. He was saying that the enemies getting past the Gorge of Death would never happen. I will see you soon. Rosalind said a short farewell before ending the call. Kale turned around and looked back at Crown Prince Alberu. Alberu motioned for Kale to speak. Your Highness, it looks like we will need to gather people together one more time. It was now the end of winter. They needed to do it one more time before spring arrived. Kale started to prepare for the final battle against the Indomitable Alliance. Chapter 232. Something obvious, too. The battle at the Gorge of Death would take place in two days. Kale had to busy himself in the remaining time. Ha! Huh. Well, at least he was supposed to. Kale brushed his face with both of his hands. Choi Han, what is this estimate sheet for? Kale was waving a piece of paper in his hand. Flap, flap. The paper that was fluttering in Kale's hand had a lot of numbers written on it. A piece of the palace had been broken, and this was the breakdown of the costs of the repair. Choi Han silently lowered his head. Kale sighed and picked up another piece of paper. That paper fluttered in the air as well. He was looking at Mary this time. Why did three nobles suddenly fall ill? An innocent and mechanical voice responded back. I am not sure. They were curious about my powers, so I showed them a bit of it. Mary recalled the small gathering that had happened after the parade. It was only a small celebration as the war was not over yet, however, it looked as if the world was sparkling in Mary's eyes. It was an extremely shocking experience for Mary, Satasha had helped the overwhelmed Mary head out to the terrace to rest. Three nobles had appeared at the terrace at that time and spoken to her in a friendly way, asking about her powers. She thought that they were trying to get close to her and showed them a bit of her power. But they suddenly said that I should throw young master Kale Nim away and join up with them. They said that we could then take you down and take power for ourselves. He he he. Kale turned his head after hearing suppressed laughter coming from behind him. Crown Prince Alberu had his head down on his desk with his shoulders moving up and down. It was obvious that he was struggling to keep himself from laughing. Kale's lips started to twist. And. The black robe started to speak in a serious manner. She had become wary of the three nobles at that moment. So then am I the enemy? That was what I asked them. They responded back with, you can be the enemy, or you can come and join us from here on. The three nobles were people from the central faction. They were trying to pull Mary toward their faction, however, Mary heard the nobles' conversation about power differently. I wondered if they were from Arm as they were talking about taking you down, young master Nim. I thought they were either from Arm or the Indomitable Alliance. However, I just remained quiet as you told me not to fight but then they just suddenly fainted. Mary recalled how the three people had suddenly started to faint. They were weird people. Mary could not understand the courage that those weak people had to say that she could be their enemy. Ha! Huh. Kale let out a deep sigh. He could still hear Alberu's snickering, but he ignored it as he looked toward Choi Han. Choi Han's situation was a typical cliché. One of the noble's sons threw a glove at you? Choi Han lowered his head once more. Someone else responded in his stead. Yes sir. Young Master Nim, it was Vice Captain Hillsman. During the celebration, Marquis Aelin's successor suddenly questioned whether Choi Han was really a swordmaster and threw a glove at him in order to issue a challenge. Kale had a blank expression on his face. Fantasy worlds always had the spoiled young masters who challenge the main character or other strong characters. Marquis Aelin. 
The Aelin household was known as the strongest martial artist household in the southeast region in the entire Rhone Kingdom. And? I'm sure Choi Han would normally have ignored such a thing. Of course. We remembered your orders and ignored him. However, that noble's son then started to talk crap about the Henatus household. What did he say? He said that, for being a martial arts household, the Henatus household is extremely weak. All they do is use money in order to have strong subordinates to protect them. Well, they're not wrong. Kale didn't really take it as talking crap. Although the members of the Henatus household knew how to handle the sword, there were no extremely strong individuals. Lily does show great potential, however, it was still only potential for now. Furthermore, the person had said that they were rich and had strong subordinates. Isn't that even better? It didn't annoy him at all. However, Contrary to his expectations, Hillsman still seemed to be angry as he was huffing and puffing. That was why Choi Han accepted the challenge, he ended up destroying the palace's training ground in the process, but it is not his fault that that young master was so weak. Pwahahaha. Alberu's laughter hit Kale's ears like background music. Hillsman continued to speak. Of course, Marquis Aelin appeared and took that young master with him. He then apologized to Choi Han and said that he would apologize to the Henatus household as well. A message will be sent to Count Henatus soon. My poor life. Alberu's laughter became even louder. Human. I truly am the best. Rayan's voice echoed like background music in Kale's mind. He then jumped up from his seat. Choi Han and Mary tilted their heads in confusion as they looked toward Kale. Even the crown prince held back his laughter as he looked at Kale. Where are you going? The crown prince asked with a serious expression. I'm going to go get some air, your highness. Oh, should I go for a walk as well? Alberu could see a blank expression on Kale's face. But I am going to the north. What? Kale's walk was to quite the distance away. I will be back in half a day. Kale needed to go north before going to the Breck kingdom. It was because of the ancient dragon, Arahabin's request. Arahabin was still in the eastern continent looking into the stone pillar in the Lieben city region on Kale's behalf. He had something to do on the western continent and Kale agreed to do so in his place. I need to go see the elves. The north. That lake was probably still surrounded by snow. He needed to go see the elves and the world tree. You'll be back in half a day? Yes, your highness. It was fine as long as Rayon was with him. Then we just need to finish the preparations while you are away. Mary, Choi Han, and Hillsman's expressions changed after hearing Alberu's comment. Kale looked around at them and nodded his head. That sounds great. Kale went for his walk with a light heart. The elf village underneath the lake with the world tree. Here, we gathered some more. The young elf priestess took a pouch out of her loose sleeves and handed it to Kale. Clang. Clang. The refreshing sound of coins hitting each other reached Kale's ears. The world tree has not said anything, but I thought that we would need another bag of money. I gathered it on my own accord. We cannot have a sea of fire. The young priestess made it sound like she was close to Kale as she welcomed him with a bright smile. Um, thanks. Kale debated it for a moment before taking the bag of money. It should be fine to take it because elves are not materialistic. Kale was not the type to reject when someone gave him free money. Instead, he took a small jewel out of his pocket and started to speak. Lead the way. I understand. The world tree has been waiting for you. The young priestess energetically started to walk. Kale slowly followed behind the young elf. Oh. Rayon Nim, your cuteness is just as explosive as ever. I get to meet Rayon Nim like this again. I can die happily now. The great and mighty Rayon Nim. He could hear the voices of other elves coming from behind him. Rayon, who puffed up his chest and was flapping his wings, pointed his front paw toward them. I am busy right now, you can admire me a bit later. He then chased behind Kale. Kale peeked toward Rayon and then patted him on the head as he continued to walk toward the world tree. In addition to Arahabin's request, he had something to ask the world tree. Shush he headed for the spot where the leaves of the large trees rustled in the wind. It was the average looking tree at the center of that bunch. Kale could see that the world tree looked even more average than last time. Hey world tree, have you been well? One of the world tree's branches slightly trembled as if responding to Rayon. The world tree had lost three branches while telling Kale three things last time. 
Find Rayan's parents. There is an existence that has gathered three ancient powers. Find the water of judgment. Kale remembered what the world tree had told him. Kale Nim, you can speak to the world tree like last time. I guess it is possible to chat now. The world tree had fallen into a slight slumber after telling Kale those three facts. The young elf put on an odd smile and nodded her head. Yes, short conversations are possible. Kale slowly headed toward the world tree. He then put his hand on the trunk and closed his eyes. Kale, it's been a while. The world tree sounded weak. Kale held the small jewel with his other hand. This is the item that Arahab and Nim made. There is a defensive magic in order to protect the elf village and world tree Nim within in it. Arahaban had decided to strengthen the defensive magic around the world tree after one of the branches was stolen and had asked Kale to take care of it. Rayon will install it. It will not take long. Is that so? Thank you. Tell Arahaban thanks as well. The world tree's voice was slightly shaking even though they were just having a short conversation. Kale's expression turned into a frown. The world tree must have realized this, as it started to explain. I am still in recovery. I've already recovered a good amount. I should return to full strength within the year. Kale was glad to hear this. If the world tree was at full strength, there would be no reason to strengthen the defense. However, Arahaban chose to strengthen the world tree with defensive magic because it was hurt. You look like you have some questions. Is there something you wish to say? Kale's shoulders flinched. He debated it for a moment before starting to speak. You don't need to respond if something similar to last time will happen. The young priestess who can only hear Kale's voice flinched after hearing, like last time. She recalled how the branches had fallen down. Her heart was beating so fast just thinking about it. Rayon recalled that as well and started to frown. Sure. Kale started to speak after hearing the world tree's response. He made it a little vague knowing that Rayon was by his side. He knew that the world tree would still understand. Where do I need to go to find it? Not the water of judgment. The others that he had to find. He was talking about Rayan's parents. Kale bit down on his lips. He didn't want to ask if he didn't need to do so, however, it was difficult to find any clues. This was especially because they were currently in the middle of a war. I guess I can answer this one. Kale subconsciously let out a sigh of relief. The weak but slightly strengthened voice entered his head. I'm sure it is not the answer you want to hear, however, this is my current limit. Not the answer I want to hear. A king is someone who is accepted by nature. Why is the world tree suddenly talking about a king? Kale started to frown. However, he had no choice but to pay attention to the world tree's words. An existence that should have died is alive. The hand touching the tree flinched. Kale had asked about Rayan's parents, however, he had heard a different response. The existence that should have died in volume 1 of the birth of a hero. Rayon Miru. Nature has accepted that existence. Nature had accepted the existence that should have died. The one that has a twisted fate. That alone was enough to receive the qualifications to survive. Changes, the forbidden and the unbelievable. Plop. Kale felt something pat him. He then calmed himself back down. He could see Rayon's round head when he looked down. Human, is everything okay? Kale heard the faint voice of the world tree at that moment. That is what nature truly is. A continuation of the mysterious and the ever-changing. That was the way nature worked. Is it possible? Kale was thinking about the king that nature would approve. The chubby dragon that was slightly more than 1 meter and 20 centimeters slowly started to frown. Human. Why are you looking at me like that? The young priestess approached them and started to speak as Kale could not respond back. The world tree Nim has fallen asleep again. I know. I'll come visit again next time. Rayon had a disappointed expression as he kicked the sand on the ground with his feet. How disappointing. I wish to speak to the world tree as well. There's no way, right? Kale shook his head to get rid of such thoughts. There was no way that was possible. If what he was thinking about was correct, he had started off by causing an extremely serious issue. There's no way saving a single dragon would cause that big of an issue. Dragon Lord. Kale could not say that word out loud as he started to speak to Rayon. Let's hurry back. All right. I will hurry so we can go see Locke. Kale watched as the six years old dragon took the jewel he had received from Arahaban and flew off toward the defensive barrier before pushing everything off in his mind. 
A half day later with only one day left before the battle with the Indomitable Alliance. Kale was standing on top of a teleportation magic circle with Rayon. He was headed somewhere other than the Rhone Kingdom right now. Pot. Kale opened his closed eyes. He could hear the invisible Rayon's voice. It's been a while since we've seen everyone. Kale started to smile. They were inside a small tent. A teleportation magic circle was drawn within this tent. There were two people greeting him as he stepped out of it. Long time no see. Rosalind and Locke. The two of them welcomed Kale over. Choi Han, Hillsman, and Mary had not come over yet. Kale had come here stealthily without anybody else knowing about it. Kale was smiling brightly as it had been a while since he had last seen the two of them. However, that smile quickly disappeared. Long time no see, young master Kale. Rosalind was smiling, but there was something slightly odd about it. Next to her was Locke, who had his head down and could not look at Kale in the eyes. The wolf boy Locke. He could not dare to look Kale in the eyes. Kale flinched after seeing Locke act this way. Is he upset because I left him here alone for a long time? It was the moment Kale had that thought. Young Master Nim. Yes, Locke. Long time no see. Kale put a hand on Locke's curled up shoulder after hearing his upset voice. Pat, Pat. His hand patted Locke's shoulder. You suffered quite a bit on your own here. It was the moment he said that. I'm sorry, hum? Kale could see the now slightly taller Locke's face. Although his head was down, Locke's eyes were looking at Kale. Locke hesitated for a moment before starting to speak with shaking lips. I can't go berserk anymore. What? What is he talking about? Berserk transformation. It was when beast people were at their strongest. It was the moment that their animal features and their human features became much stronger. But that wasn't possible anymore. He can't do it even though his first berserk transformation already happened? Locke continued to speak despite his shaking hands as Kale thought about this issue. However, Locke's voice was extremely shaky. I, I need to hurry up and become the Wolf King's successor. I really need to do that. Originally, Locke would have grown after the despair caused by losing Pendrick. It looks like I cannot get stronger, but this Locke was different than the one from the novel. He wanted to be stronger, but could not go berserk. Kale looked back at the tall young boy who could not look him in the eyes. Chapter 233. Something obvious. 3. The young boy with his head down. Kale could also see Rosalind who was looking at Locke with a concerned expression. He was a beast person who could not go berserk even after his first berserk transformation had already passed. Rosalind did not know what to say as this was the first time she had heard about such a situation. It made it even more difficult for her to say anything to the weakened Locke as she herself had gotten much stronger in the past few months. That was why her expression did not look good as she gazed toward Locke and Kale. It was at that moment. Rosalind's body flinched. Plop. The tense entrance was lifted up and someone shouted inside. Commander Nim, the Rhone Kingdom's forces have arrived. They were calling for Rosalind. She was the commander for all magic in the Breck Kingdom. She had come back to her senses thanks to the person outside. The Rhone Kingdom's forces, although they were not large in number, friends that she could trust to cover her back were coming. It was a happy and welcomed arrival. At the same time, she recalled the upcoming battle and knew that she needed to hurry. However, Locke's current situation made her hesitate. She heard a quiet voice at that moment. Pat. Why is a young boy like you so skinny? Rosalind could see Kale pat Locke on the back before heading toward the tent entrance. Kale opened up the flap in order to exit as he looked toward Locke. Let's go. Locke fidgeted and could not move. Rayon, push him. Those words made Locke flinch. He could then feel a small paw gently pushing his back. Everybody wants to see you. Let's go, Locke. Although he was invisible, Locke could feel Rayon's existence based on his paw and his voice. Locke thought about the people waiting for him, as well as the dragon pushing him as he bit down on his lips and slowly started to walk. He was extremely weak if he could not enter his berserk state. He was still stronger than the normal person, but compared to the others, compared to his family, he was so weak that he was likely to be a burden. That was why he was not confident enough to greet them. Kale started to speak as soon as the young boy stopped right in front of him. Focus on my back. Follow behind me and don't think about anything else. Locke's head slowly raised up. Pat, pat. He could feel the small paw patting him on the back as well. 
The flap covering the tent entrance was completely lifted. Locke could see the Breck Kingdom's people standing in formation outside the tent. The Gorge of Death. Many people had been stationed at different spots on the long and dangerous gorge ever since a few days ago. They were using magic in order to stealthily hide their movements. This was the spot where the largest number of people were gathered. Rosalind and the leaders of the Breck Kingdom were all here. Locke could see the leaders and their forces standing outside. They had all gathered here in order to see a single person. The Rhone Kingdom's northeast region's commander. They were all waiting for him. Locke could see Kale heading out of the tent. He had heard a lot about the war while spending time with some of the Breck Kingdom's mages at the Gorge of Death. Locke naturally had heard about how much work Kale and the others had put in. That was why Kale's back seemed extremely large to him. Kale seemed to be someone who was worlds apart from someone like him. However, Locke then heard Kale's voice, Are you not coming? Kale still had his back toward Locke, but he was standing there without moving. Locke then felt two gentle pushes on his back. One was Rosalind, while the other was the invisible dragon. Locke slowly started to walk. He no longer paid any attention to the Breck Kingdom's leaders outside the tent. He walked while only looking at Kale's back. That was why he seemed curled up as he looked down at the shorter Kale, however, nothing was preventing him from walking forward anymore. Kale started to walk as he looked around. There was a large number of people gathered here. However, the majority of the Breck Kingdom's forces were stationed at the closest city next to the Gorge of Death, ready to move at any moment. Kale looked toward Rosalind, who walked up to him and started to speak. Are all the troops moved? Yes, young master Kale. We installed teleportation magic circles at multiple points around the gorge, while the knights and soldiers will all gather early tomorrow morning. The information about the Indomitable Alliance was currently being sent through Klopa Seca. The Rhone Kingdom had decided that it was better for the Indomitable Alliance to not know about Klopa and the Paran Kingdom's betrayal until later. That was why the Breck Kingdom's preparations for the Indomitable Alliance were done as secretly as possible. Early the next morning. That was the time Klopa had said the Indomitable Alliance would make their move. Young Master Kale, the number of forces we are currently moving should not seem odd, even if the Indomitable Alliance manages to notice it. Of course. As Rosalind mentioned, the number of people that were already at each spot seemed normal and not as if they were preparing for battle. The Indomitable Alliance had not given up yet. In that case, where else could they strike? Anybody would be able to tell that it would be the Breck Kingdom. People could not easily believe it because of the Gorge of Death, however, it would seem normal that the Breck Kingdom would send approximately 100 soldiers to places around the Gorge of Death, just in case. Rosalind started to speak. The Rhone Kingdom and Breck Kingdom's mage brigades will be able to properly show themselves this time. Kale looked at Rosalind's confident smile and chuckled. This was the mage brigade's true leader. Rosalind had not shown herself until now. She was a highest grade mage with the qualifications to be a future magic tower master. She had spent the last few months strengthening herself and her magic abilities. The thought of using that power for the first time was making her mind run wild right now. I'm curious about this method that the dwarves figured out in order to cross the gorge of death. Kale recalled one piece of information Klopa had provided after hearing Rosalind's thought. The flame dwarf tribe will supposedly play a big role in the upcoming attack. They said that they found a way to freely move across the Gorge of Death. However, they will not reveal the method until right before the attack. It looks like they are seeking redemption for the ships at the Karo Kingdom. I think they are trying to exaggerate their abilities by revealing it at the last possible moment. Anyway, I will let our Rhone Kingdom know as soon as I find out, so it shouldn't matter, right? Ha 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 ha. Kale started to frown after recalling Klopa's crazy laugh as well. He would only trust half of what that crazy bastard said from now on. Rosalind did not see Kale's expression as she pointed to a side. Ah, young master Kale. You know Count Ecross, right? Kale's gaze headed toward where Rosalind was pointing. Count Ecross. He was the number one disciple of the top mage in the Breck Kingdom, making him the second ranked mage in the entire Breck Kingdom. Of course, Rosalind was not a part of that ranking. Kale clearly remembered how Ecross had ignored and looked down on him when he visited the Gorge of Death last time. Count Ecross flinched as soon as they made eye contact, he subconsciously gulped. Kale Henitus. Ecross clearly remembered how Kale had come with the Tiger tribe earlier in the year. 
The Kale from back then and Commander Kale in uniform today felt extremely different. It could not be helped as Ecross had heard about everything Kale had done. The battle at the Henatus territory, the battle at the Rhone Kingdom's northeast region's shores, and finally, the battle in the Karo Kingdom. All of those deeds had made Count Ecross embarrassed about his past actions, however, he felt relief knowing that the Kale who came to assist the Breck Kingdom was reliable. Long time no see, Count Ecross. Yes, Commander Kale Nim. It has been a while. Count Ecross subconsciously used respectful language toward Kale, however, neither of them realized the change. I knew he would be like this. Rayon had realized it, but Kale did not have time to pay attention to him. Commander Nim. Kale Nim. Kale could see a group of people walking toward him from the other side. They were the Roan Kingdom's first Knight's Brigade and the Mage Brigade. Finally, there was Choi Han, Mary, and the rest of his group. Count Ecross looked toward the main characters responsible for the Roan Kingdom's victory and took a small step back. They had already won two battles. The aura around them was completely different than his own. Kale looked at the people around him and started to speak. Let us start our meeting. The dwarves' method of crossing the gorge, the lion tribe and bear tribe, and even the enemy soldiers that will come with them. They needed a good plan that would make all of them walk on top of their palms. Kale headed back to the tent with Rosalind and the other leaders and passed by Locke, who was standing behind him. He walked by and said something to Locke. Let's eat dinner together tonight. Kale saw that Choi Han, Mary, and the others who were not a part of the meeting surround Locke and continued to walk without any second thoughts. What are you doing? Are you not going to eat? This tent had been created for Kale. A decent dinner table was set up in this quite large tent that was imbued with soundproof magic. Kale continued to eat the food in front of him and peeked toward the other side. Did the Breck Kingdom not feed you? And, no, they did. Locke flailed his arms in shock. However, Kale's expression did not look good. Kim Rock Su had once had to starve in the past. He did not enjoy seeing children looking so skinny. Although Locke had always looked feeble and his tall height made him skinny from the start, he seemed even thinner now. Kale looked at Locke, who was holding a fork but unable to eat anything, before turning his gaze back to his plate. If you have something to say, hurry up and say it so that you can eat some food. Locke flinched and looked at Kale. Only Rayon, Kale, and Locke were at the table. The others were eating dinner together elsewhere. Locke knew the reason Kale had prepared this meal for just the three of them. He slowly started to speak. Really, I really trained very hard. I wanted to show you that you were right to trust me, and so I trained as hard as I could. I trust you. Locke had trained endlessly at the Gorge of Death in order to thank Kale for trusting him. He had worked so hard, such that he had almost passed out numerous times. Every day felt so long at the Gorge of Death if he did not do that. But most importantly, he didn't want to be left behind as his friends got stronger. I pushed myself harder and harder after hearing about how Choi Han Hung and the others performed during the battles. The story of how they had protected the Henatus territory. The story about the battle at the Rhone Kingdom's shores. Hearing those stories had made his heart beat wildly. My family did these things. He was so proud that he wanted to share it with everybody while being thankful that they were okay. He then used it in order to motivate himself as he was left alone at the gorge. I read through the Wolf King's diary that you gave me, young Master Nim. He had a wonderful tool to assist him. The diary that Kale had given him. That diary had been written in someone's blood. Kale had read that diary as well. He looked toward Locke. This was written inside the diary. The reason Kale had left Locke here alone had to do with the diary as well. The young boy started to recite what he had read in the diary. Wolves need to know about loss and loneliness. Only when they are alone can they realize the importance of those that are precious to them and become stronger. Locke did not disagree with the statement. He agreed with the old diary. The words written in dry blood were correct. He too had gone through his first berserk transformation when he had lost the Blue Wolf tribe and his family. That was when he had first found a way to get stronger. What the Wolf King was saying was true. Although a wolf may shed its own blood, it will not allow those precious to it to bleed. Locke had agreed with the Wolf King here as well. It was better for him to bleed than for those precious to him to bleed. He really believed this to be the case. I read that over and over and trained really hard, but. Locke saw that the hand holding his fork was shaking, 
and so he clasped his two hands together. Chapter 234. Something obvious, for, suddenly. It really had been all of a sudden. I suddenly couldn't go berserk. I can't remember how I did it. I need to quickly overcome it and take care of the issue, but I don't remember the method. It really was all of a sudden. I don't know why. Locke. Since when did it stop working? Pat, pat. Locke stopped talking as Rayon patted him on the shoulder. However, his eyes were still showing signs of uncertainty. He suddenly cannot enter his berserk transformation. This sudden regression of strength. Locke knew when it had started. That was why he could not say it. It would make him seem too stupid and useless. That, you see, the moment it started was, the tips of Locke's lips started to turn blue. Kale started to speak at that moment, no need. Locke flinched and looked to the other side. I'm sure it'll return someday. Excuse me. Locke could see that Kale was speaking with a calm expression on his face. Locke could feel the emotion coming from Kale through his expression and his voice. First, we need to fatten you up. Relax and roll around doing nothing. He's right. Locke, you are too skinny. They were extremely calm, as if they had come here on a vacation. That made Locke open and close his mouth a few times before finally managing to get a few words out. But the battle is coming up. Battle. It was such a scary and fearful word. And, however, the response he got back was extremely calm. Locke suddenly felt upset. He started to speak. I couldn't go berserk since I heard about the war. Oops. Locke's expression crumbled after revealing that fact. He lowered his head and buried his face in his hands. He recalled the moment he realized he could not go berserk. It was when Rosalind told him about the upcoming battle. It was when she had told him that the Indomitable Alliance was headed to the Breck Kingdom for a final battle. His heart had started to beat wildly at that moment. It was then that he realized he could not go berserk anymore. Ever since that moment, ever since I learned that we are going to fight, I haven't been able to go berserk anymore. I should be fighting alongside everyone else, but why is it that I cannot go berserk right before the battle? Locke was full of despair at that fact. In fact, he was despising himself. Anybody could see why he would be like this with this timing. It's like I'm trying to avoid the battle. It's as if I am afraid. I need to grow quickly to help. Locke recalled Rosalind's look of confusion about how to console him, as well as the shocked expressions on the faces of the others whom he had not seen for a while. Their concerns for him made him hate himself even more. Choi Han Hung and Rosalind Nuna saved my siblings and me. Locke did not think he came all this way on his own. There were too many people who helped guide his cowardly and timid self. Young Master Nim also saved us and gave us a home. I need to pay you back for that. But why am I like this? That was why Locke hated himself right now. He was embarrassed. Forget the Wolf King. He was just a weakling. Locke sighed after seeing that his two hands were still shaking. He heard Kale's voice again at that moment. It's okay. Kale put down his fork and looked toward Locke. Locke. It sounded as if Kale was telling Locke to look at him. The young wolf boy slowly raised his head. Kale admitted his mistake and started to speak. There are people around you. Locke had never seen such an expression on Kale's face before. I left you here alone hoping that you could learn about a wolf's loneliness. However, I did not want it to be painful. I also did not want you to be scared. Kale was not such a terrible person to want something like that to happen to a child. He thought Locke would not feel too lonely as he knew that he had a family. However, this timid child seemed to have felt pressured and burdened rather than loneliness. Loss. Originally in the novel, Healer Pendrick's death led to Locke's first berserk transformation and helped him grow. However, Kale had no plans on doing something crazy like that. Locke was only 15 years old. You had to be a lunatic to do something like that to a child. There is no reason for you to hurry. You saved me, and you trusted me. Locke's mumbling stopped as soon as Kale asked a question. Would you throw me away if I was weak? What, something like that was unbelievable. Locke throw Kale away? Locke's eyes opened wide in shock as Kale smiled back at him. Locke. You wouldn't, right? Kale picked his fork back up. So, don't ask something so obvious. Just eat. Something obvious. Locke was suddenly at a loss for words once again. If you want to repay me for my trust, show me that you are healthy first. And just watch. Your friends, no, your family members, are stronger than you think. Clang. 
Locke could see Rayon pushing a fork toward him. Kale continued to speak. Even I am strong enough to protect you during a battle. Kale was speaking in a joking tone. Locke had seen many new expressions on Kale's face today. Locke slowly picked his fork back up and started to eat. Food tasted good for the first time in a long time. He had not enjoyed even the most luxurious food while he had been at the gorge of death. Delicious. Eat a lot if it is delicious. Locke watched Kale pushing a plate full of food toward him as he continued to stuff food in his mouth. He felt as if something else would pop out if he did not do that. He suppressed his emotions by stuffing his face with food. Rayon just quietly watched as Locke did that. The black dragon's dark blue eyes then peeked to the side. The six years old dragon continued to chew as he looked toward Kale. Kale sent Locke out of his tent once Locke was full and then looked around the quiet tent. Looks like I can sleep for about three hours, he would be busy starting early in the morning. He needed to get at least a short nap in so that he could do that. Of course, there were still people standing guard, but one of his roles was to sleep right now. Rayon. What is it, human? Connect the video communication device please. Kale thought about Locke and decided that he needed to call that person. Honestly speaking, it is difficult enough to protect myself right now. It will be hard to protect that tall kid. Kale could not trust his own level of strength. That was why he was planning on using his network. He watched as Rayon prepared to take the video communication device out. By the way, human. What is it? Kale made eye contact with the six years old dragon who stopped connecting the device and looked toward him. Rayon looked at Kale and asked. I cannot go through my first growth phase, is that okay? Kale recalled how Rayon had buried himself underneath the blanket and cried about how he was not great and mighty because he could not activate his first growth phase. Kale wondered why Rayon was suddenly bringing that up. He thought that it might be because of Locke's berserk transformation situation, but regardless, he chose to answer back after seeing the dragon's gaze that seemed to be begging for a response. Didn't I answer that last time? Don't ask me something so obvious. Is it okay if I am weak? What the heck is he talking about? Kale was in disbelief at what the scary dragon that was far from weak was saying before casually answering back. I thought you were weak when I met you in the cave. The small paw touching the round video communication device flinched. The cave. Rayon recalled the moment he first met Kale. His powers were restricted as he was kept under mana restricting chains. He was weak back then. He was so weak to the point that he could not even run away and could only live in the dark cave while pretending that he didn't hear anything nor think for himself. Then he was saved. He was saved even though he was not strong. Rayon felt the rough hands caressing his head. He also heard Kale's quiet sigh and mumble about how, a six-year-old dragon is still a child. Rayon, although I am weaker than you, I've lived at least 30, no, 15 years more than you. But I am still weaker than you. I am not even as strong as you front paw. Is that a problem? Kale realized his mistake and quickly changed the years before looking at Rayon. It is not a problem at all. The young dragon's stern response made Kale nod his head as if he was saying, isn't that all that matters? Rayon went back to connecting the video communication device while peeking at Kale. He then started to speak again. Human. Why did you save me? I am just curious. Rayon could see Kale leaning on the chair as he responded back. Why did I save you? Just because. Why do you keep me by your side? Kale casually but honestly responded back to Rayon, who seemed to have more questions than usual today. Do you need a reason? Do we not need a reason? Why you saved me and why you travel with me? Do we really not need a reason for that? Rayon had not asked until now but he had been curious. Everything in the world had a reason. All things were connected, and those connections led to different situations. He knew that there must be a reason that Kale and he were traveling together. The dragon was curious as to what that reason might be. The human who claimed to have lived at least 15 years more than he had answered back. Your house is our house. Is that not enough? Your house is our house. Rayon repeated that statement in his head. He didn't know why but it sounded catchy. Rayon thought about that for a while before storing it in his mind. He suddenly felt full. The six years old dragon slowly started to smile. You're right. Human, that is enough. Kale didn't know what was going on, but sternly spoke to the once again energetic Rayon. The call. Ah, right. 
this great and mighty dragon will connect it right away. The call was soon connected. Kale left the snickering rayon on his lap as he finished the call. He then headed straight for bed. He would not be able to sleep properly once the battle began. Three hours. These three hours were very precious. Kale laid down on the bed without any hesitation in order to get his precious sleep. Kale, who laid down in his uniform so that he could get up at the last possible moment, could see Rayon putting out the light inside the tent. Rayon then laid down next to Kale on the bed. However, Kale did not care as he closed his eyes. It was easy to fall asleep as he ate until he was full along with Locke. Human, human. Kale heard Rayon's voice right before he fell asleep. This six year old really has a lot of questions today. The scariness of questions overwhelmed Kale. However, Rayon continued to ask his question. Human, would you save me again if you went back in time? Why is he like this today? I told you not to ask something so obvious. Human, would you save me again if I become that weak again and require you to save me? Kale moved his sleepy body and put his hand on Rayon's head. He felt himself slowly falling asleep as he answered back. Of course I would save you. Kale then fell asleep. Rayon watched Kale for a long time before burrowing next to Kale's side and rolling up his body into a circle before closing his eyes. I will save you even if you are weak. Those words echoed in Rayon's mind. Thanks to that, he could easily fall asleep. Soon the light breathing noises of the adult and the young dragon filled the tent. The next day. Beep beep Kale squirmed after hearing the sound of the alarm. He needed to open his eyes, but could not easily do so as he wanted to sleep some more. Ooh. Kale squirmed a bit more before forcing himself to open his eyes. He could see the ceiling of the dark tent. Beep beep the sound of the alarm. The alarm was sounding in order to wake Kale, as well as the others nearby. Kale sat up on the bed. Igu. He sounded like an old man getting up. Kale lifted his hand up and tried to wipe the side of his eyes. He then flinched. Hum. Something is weird. It was too quiet right now. It should be very loud right now. Someone should be pushing on his stomach right now. But no, it was quiet. Kale heard something instead. Who, who? It was someone breathing. However, it was kind of rough breathing. Kale slowly turned his head. Beep beep. The alarm was still going off around him. Kale's eyes slowly adjusted to the darkness and let him see the existence next to him. Yes, right next to him. This existence was curled up sleeping right next to him. He could see the curled up black dragon. Kale slowly reached his hand toward Rayan's forehead. Who, who? He had heard this type of breathing before. Kale's palm landed on Rayan's forehead. Kale started to frown. It was hot. It was too hot. Rayan's body was on fire. He could see Rayan's black wings fall into his sides without any strength. Rayan's face looked as if he had lost consciousness because his fever was too high. The battle was about to start in just a few moments, but Rayon was sick. Chapter 235. I will, you, one, Rayon. Kale called out to Rayon. However, all he got back was the rough sound of Rayon's breathing. It was completely different than when he had caught a cold last time. Kale blinked after seeing Rayon who seemed to be sleeping but had a serious fever and was breathing heavily. The first growth phase. That was the only thing he could think of. Kale recalled what Arahabin had told him in the past. He's quite smart. He's able to learn three months worth of content in only one month. But he is not growing. He's not hitting his first growth phase. It's about time for it to happen. I wonder what is going on. Rayon was a dragon who could not grow even though he had learned everything he needed to learn in order to activate it. Kale recalled what he had heard as he was falling asleep. Human, will you save me again if I become that weak again and require you to save me? Damn it. Kale couldn't help but swear. It was not because he recalled what Rayon had told him. Beep beep was there a need for an alarm to wake people up to continue to ring this loud? Should they be making this much noise when they should be wary of the enemy hearing them? Kale bit down on his lips after suddenly thinking about something. He then looked toward Rayon. The young dragon had Kale's video communication device in his spatial dimension. The guardian knight Klopa. He had only contacted Kale through that specific video communication device. Kale had ordered him to contact him through his personal video communication device if anything changed with the Indomitable Alliance's plans or if any urgent situations came up. 
Of course, he did give a separate video communication device's information to him in case of emergencies. Beep beep, Kale Nim. A voice called for him from outside the tent. Choi Han was calling his name. Kale brushed his eyes with his hands. What if something happened during the three hours he was sleeping? No. What if it happened once Rayon became sick? If Klopa had contacted him during that time? Then Kale would not have been able to answer that call. He didn't have Rayon to connect him. Beep beep this was not the sound of an alarm. It was a warning signal. It meant that something had happened. This is driving me nuts. Kale stopped frowning as best as possible and headed out of the tent. Plop. He could see soldiers hurriedly moving about outside the tent. Light continued to flash from the teleportation magic circle located at the base as well. The soldiers and knights stationed at the nearby city were all being teleported over. Kale Nim, the enemy is appearing on the other side of the gorge. Kale turned his head toward the direction of Choi Han's voice. He could see Choi Han, Hillsman, Mary, and Locke. He could also see some of the knights of the Royal Knights Brigade, no, the core members of the Rhone Kingdom's forces. Kale opened his mouth to speak. Choi Han and Locke, come inside. The rest of you stand by. Choi Han found it odd that he was calling them inside, but followed Kale's order anyway. He could see the urgency in Kale's eyes. The enemy did not seem to be the problem. Had Klopa betrayed them? That thought made Choi Han hurry. He then saw the darkness inside the tent and stopped walking. Kale Nim. Even Locke who was following behind him stopped in shock. Choi Han and Locke could see Rayon who was on the bed with his eyes closed. The expression on Choi Han's face changed. The confusion on his face quickly disappeared. I was wondering if the Guardian Knight betrayed us. This must be why you didn't say anything about the current situation, Kale Nim. Choi Han realized that Kale had not received any information from Klopa right now. He felt upset after seeing Rayon being sick even though they were in an urgent situation. Kale Nim. But seeing that Kale, who should be the most upset, was calm made Choi Han be able to calmly continue to speak. We noticed ten minutes ago that the enemy was using teleportation magic circles to do large-scale transportations. That is why we are gathering our forces as well. They were using the large teleportation magic circles that the Mage Brigade had prepared for the gathering. Although it is three hours earlier than expected, all five large teleportation magic circles are currently being used to gather the Breck Kingdom's forces to the Gorge of Death. The Gorge of Death cut through the western continent from east to west. They had placed five teleportation magic circles by the center of the route that was the shortest distance to the nearby Breck Kingdom city. The third magic circle was located at the center of this route. That was where Kale was currently stationed. Rosalyn is currently at the border of the Breck Kingdom and the Gorge of Death in order to prepare for the enemy attack. Kale did not say anything before turning to look on top of his bed. The only person who knew about Kale's group's situation and was able to use a video communication device was Rosalyn now that Rayon was out of commission. However, she was currently waiting to fight against the enemy. I guess Arahab and Nim will not be possible. It was difficult to contact the ancient dragon right now. Many different thoughts passed through Kale's head. At the same time, he remembered something he had heard as Kim Rock Su when he first started a proper job. You must be calm. A person who handles information must always have a cool heart. Got it, newbie? It was what his former team leader had told him. The voice of the man who noticed Kim Rock Su's talents and helped him grow was always calm. Although his insides were boiling, Kale's cold gaze looked toward Choi Han. However, he called for someone else. Locke. Yes sir. You will stand by my side no matter what. No matter what. Got it. Locke clenched his fist and responded back. Yes, yes sir. Locke's mind was boiling as well. Beep beep. Locke's mind became complicated along with the loud sound of the alarm. Kale turned and headed toward the bed once Locke responded. He used a blanket to wrap the curled up rayon. He covered him from head to tail. The small dragon that was only 1 meter 20 cm in length was quickly covered up. Kale picked him up and held him in his arms. He could not leave him here. However, he could also not stay here by his side. So what else could he do? He had to carry him with him. Choi Han. Choi Han started to speak as soon as Kale called for him. I will stay by the three of your side at all times today. That will be my priority. Kale, Locke, and Rayon. Choi Han was clear about where he needed to be today. 
The battle was an issue and he wanted to help Rosalind protect her kingdom, however, his family came first to him. What are you talking about? However, Choi Han could see Kale frowning at him. He seemed to have his usual grumbling expression. Choi Han, you destroy them before they get here. Destroy the enemy before they arrive. Choi Han's expression turned odd. At the same time, Kale headed over to Locke and handed him the wrapped up rayon. Kale's arms that were holding rayon up were slightly shaking. Although he was not very long, the now chubby rayon was quite heavy. Here. Excuse me. Yes sir. Locke carefully held rayon in confusion. He could feel rayon's weight in his arms. Once he looked down, he could see the heavily breathing rayon that no one else would be able to see. Locke put some strength into his arms after feeling an unexplainable feeling. The existence that he thought was strong because he was a dragon was not as heavy as he expected and was currently sick. Rayon was also part of Locke's family. Are you not coming? Ah, oh, yes sir. Locke quickly followed behind Kale. Stick to my back without getting away at all today. Got it? Yes sir. Locke understood Kale's intentions. He was trying to protect the two of them. Although he had a calm expression on his face, how worried must he be on the inside? Locke knew exactly what he had to do during this battle. Carry the sick rayon. Follow behind Kale properly. They weren't much, but the fact that he now had something to do during the battle made Locke's body start to fill with strength. Wolves became stronger when they had someone or something to protect. There was only a slight difference between loneliness and a sense of belonging. That was a fact that neither Locke nor Kale knew much about. Choi Han watched as Kale left the tent with Locke. Plop. The flap was lifted again and Kale stood in front of the Roan Kingdom's core forces that were looking at him. Mary, Hillsman, the Mage Brigade, and the First Royal Knights Brigade. Beep beep although the alarm was going off and it was chaotic, the Roan Kingdom's forces were waiting for Kale without any worries. Kale stood in front of them as Choi Han came out of the tent and walked up next to Kale as well. Kale started to speak at that moment. Our goal for today is simple. Kale clearly explained their goal to the group. Choose defense over attack. The Silver Shield. The source of the power that people knew about was Rayon. The defensive strength of Kale's shield was only possible because Rayon was with him. It was impossible to expect him to be able to do the same feats today. However, Kale could not show his weakness to them. He could only give them a different order. Do not go far. Do not be alone either. Make sure you are always moving in groups of at least three people. Although they came to help the Breck Kingdom, Kale cared more about his life and the lives of the people from his territory first. He was making sure that he, and the people close to him, survived. That was why Kale was telling the Roan Kingdom's people to choose to act defensively. Except for one person. Choi Han clenched the scabbard in his hand. He nodded his head instead of responding to Kale, who was looking at him. Go out before defending. That was why he was the only person who was told to destroy the enemy before they arrived. Choi Han understood the meaning of that clearly. Rayon was not available. Then he was the only one left. Kale started to speak again as Choi Han started to smile. Everybody to your positions. The mages' robes and knights' armors made different noises as their formations started to move in different directions. Kale started to walk somewhere as well. Mary, Hillsman, Choi Han, and Locke were next to him. Did something happen to Rayon Nim? The mechanical voice of Mary was shaking for once. Kale looked toward the black robe and the concerned hillsman next to her as he responded back. Something came up. He could see the two of them flinch. However, Kale did not say anything to them like, relax. You needed to face your troubles head on. That was the only way to accurately determine the situation and find a path out. Kale explained this fact to the two of them. That is why you both need to make sure that you are alert so that nothing happens to anyone else. Mary and Hillsman closed their mouths at that response. Do not get hurt and stay alert. Mary's shaking lips and Hillsman's concerned expression quickly returned to normal. Kale turned away from the silent duo and headed toward someone. Rosalind. He needed to go to her. She was the one who would have the best grasp of the current situation and he needed to ask for her help. Kale could see Rosalind's back. Swish swish. The wind was blowing. It was still dark as it was very early in the morning. The Gorge of Death was made of extremely deep cliffs that twisted left and right for hundreds of kilometers. Rosalind was at the deepest cliff that was the border between the Breck Kingdom and the Askausan Kingdom. 
she was standing there looking at the Askausan forces on the other side of the cliff. Next to her was the Mage Brigade and the large teleportation magic circle. Pot, pot. The large teleportation magic circle continued to flash non-stop as knights and soldiers continued to appear. However, Kale did not look at any of that. Just, what the? He heard Vice Captain Hillsman's voice, however, he could not pay attention to him at all. He looked across the cliff, it was the enemy land. Many flashes of light were appearing there as well. Another light flashed on Kale's side. It was the light that was coming off of the large teleportation magic circle. Tens of those lights were flashing on the other side of the cliff. Seems fitting for the final battle, the other side of the cliff. A large number of enemies were looking at them as they stood by the gorge. It was an impossibly large number of enemy forces. Flap, flap. The flags that symbolized that they were part of the Indomitable Alliance were fluttering in the rough winds on the other side of the gorge. It was an unbelievable number in comparison to the number of soldiers that had attacked the Karo Kingdom or the Rhone Kingdom. Furthermore, the northern lands, including the Parun Kingdom, were all kingdoms of knights. Knights were stronger on the ground, and if they are strong on the ground, they would naturally have strong soldiers as well. Other than the river at the bottom of the long cliff cutting between the Breck Kingdom and the Askausan Kingdom, no source of water existed here. I expected it, but seeing it in person makes it feel real that there are a lot of them. No, there are more than what that crazy bastard told us. Excuse me. There were more enemies than what Klopa had told him. Specifically, there were too many soldiers, Miss Rosalind. Young Master Kale. Kale's hand was placed on Rosalind's shoulder. A single question continued to fill his mind. He quickly whispered in Rosalind's ear, How are they going to cross with that many people? That many people. Just what were they going to do to get all of them across the gorge? Chapter 236. I will, you, too. The gorge of death that splits the two kingdoms is still there. No matter how strong they are on land, the enemy cannot get here if they do not have a way to cross the gorge. In fact, the Breck Kingdom's mages had the advantage as they could use long distance attacks to strike from the other side of the gorge. They had a lot of soldiers, but it didn't matter if they couldn't attack. Young Master Kale, that's what I wanted to ask you did something happen? Rosalind had been waiting for Kale until now. She was waiting for Kale to bring her information from Klopa. However, Kale's question made her realize that Kale had no information as well. Rayon is sick. Rosalind's expression changed. She quickly took out a video communication device and handed it to Kale. Where should I connect you to? His Highness, Prince Alberu. Rosalind did not say anything else as she started to channel her mana in order to connect the video communication device. However, she did not need to do that. Beep beep her video communication device started to glow red. She immediately connected the call and handed it to Kale. Kale. Your Highness. What did he say? Alberu Crossman was the only other person's contact information that Klopa had. It was because Alberu was the only person who would know what Kale was planning to do and take care of things properly. Kale was certain that Klopa had told Alberu how they were going to move the troops. Kale was waiting for Alberu's response. It was at that moment. Commander Nim, the soldiers are stepping back, a knight shouted toward Rosalind. At the same time, Kale could see the enemy soldiers moving in formations. The large number of soldiers were all moving at the same time. Boom. 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 The ground started to shake. At the same time, a path appeared from in between the soldiers. Kale heard Alberu's voice at that moment. Apparently, they made wings. They supposedly got the idea from seeing the necromancers flying monsters in the Henatus territory's battle. Alberu Crossman urgently continued to speak. Kale could see the bears walking through the path between the soldiers. Since it was difficult to control the wyverns without Klopa, they supposedly killed them all. The dwarves then used the wyverns' bones, steel, and magic stones to make wings. They were able to make multiple wings with every wyvern. Boom. 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 The ground started to shake with every step the bears took. They were the beast people tribe that was known to be the most numerous of the strong beast people. The bear tribe. There were large wings on each of their shoulders. They were bone wings that were imitating wyvern wings. The large bears in their berserk states were able to carry those wings. Rosalind's urgent voice could be heard. Your Highness, how many of them are there? 
She looked toward the bears that were starting to appear on the other side and asked as Alberu immediately responded back. At least 1,000. 1,000. That was not a small number. There were at least 1,000 enemies that could fly in the air. It's not just the bears, it is 1,000, including the dwarves. Kale could see the strong but short dwarves with smaller wings behind the bears. The flame dwarf tribe. They appeared for the first time in this war. They were all short but muscular and had strong looking weapons in their hands. Furthermore, dwarves in general were known for being physically strong. Rosalind watched them and started to get a headache. How are those wings activated? If they are using magic stones, it has to be using magic. Can't the mages just shoot them down with magic when they are in the air? She then suddenly had a different question. How will the soldiers cross over? Kale and Alberu soon answered that question for her. That's not it, is it? One more thing. Alberu immediately responded back. Screech, screech. They could hear the sounds of machines. It sounded as if extremely heavy wheels were moving. Commander Nim. The knights are stepping back as well. Now the enemy knights were stepping back as well. Tens of thousands of enemies were moving now. A large item appeared between those moving soldiers and knights. They made a bridge. Something to connect the two sides of the gorge in multiple locations. The dwarves had announced that they were going to build bridges. The 1,000 soldiers with wings are meant to fight until the bridges can be installed. The thousand flyers were not aiming to attack them directly. The enemy was aiming to defend as well. Their jobs were to protect the bridges. That is a bridge? Rosalind could not trust Alberu's words. No, it is not a bridge. That was not a bridge. There are magic bombs on it. She looked toward the large item being pushed on top of wheels. She was certain that there were magic bombs inside of it. Um, she could tell by the vibrations coming from the other side of the gorge. They were full of magic bombs that were on the verge of exploding. Rosalind heard Kale's voice at that moment. The soldiers and knights are continuing to withdraw. It looks like their goal was to cover those things. Their goal was to prevent the Rhone Kingdom from seeing. Rosalind looked toward the wings and magic bomb that the soldiers and knights had been covering up. Kale continued to speak. The cliff. A path will be created if you destroy both sides of the cliff. I suppose that is a bridge of sort as well. Rosalind looked down. She could see the ground. The cliffs were on separate sides of the gorge. However, if both of these cliffs crumbled, the debris from the cliffs would cover up the gorge. Rosalind could see the enemy continuing to withdraw. They were stepping back as if they were doing their best to avoid the impact. Destroy the Gorge of Death. Rosalind then turned toward Kale. Alberu started to speak again. He said that the dwarves had one goal. They are trying to create a path for them to be able to come down to the south at any time. This was the final battle. However, it was the final battle to prepare for another start. They will destroy the gorge that hinders their ability to do that. The dwarves had prepared for this final battle with thoughts about destroying one of the five forbidden regions. That is why the Askausan Kingdom and the Norland Kingdom moved all of their forces in order to show their support for the dwarves' decisions. It explained the sudden increase in the number of soldiers. This was the way of the rest of the Indomitable Alliance showing their support. It would mean that they would not lose, even if they lost this battle. It would give them the option of planning for the future. These damn bastards, Rosalind could not understand the thoughts of people who were pushed into a corner. That was why she had not expected such a situation. That was also why the sights in front of her were making her anxious. Rosalind's expression became cold as she started to speak. Back. Everybody move back. She then gave another order. All mages get into attack formation. Rayon was sick right now. Rosalind felt that she was the only one here who could take charge of the magic. She gave an order to the mages who were teleporting the soldiers over. Stop the teleportations. Excuse me. Magic bombs and the resulting explosion. It would be more difficult with the soldiers here. The soldiers may end up getting dragged into the explosion as well. She needed to delay their teleportation. Furthermore, magic was more important than the soldiers right now. They needed long distance attacks. Everyone prepare to attack. She decided to have the mages responsible for the teleportation magic circles to join in on the attack as well. The greatest defense was completely sealing the enemy's attack. Rosalind hid her anxiety as she continued to give order after order. She then heard something she did not want to hear. Boom. 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 
The bears with the large wings. They started to run. They started to run toward the cliff. Hundreds of them jumped off the cliff as if they wanted to get help flying up. Boom. Boom. Rosalind's pupils started to shake as she watched them move. She also heard something else she did not want to hear. Ung the large container with tens, no, an unknown number of magic bombs started to make noises as well. The device activating it seemed to be slow, however, it was progressing bit by bit. It seemed as if it would be flung this way soon. Is alchemy mixed in as well? All sorts of thoughts were on her mind right now. It was at that moment. Miss Rosalind. She could hear Kale's voice. Young Master Kale. Rosalind, who looked toward Kale with despair on her face, flinched. Consider it as payment in advance. Kale handed her a small pouch. Rosalind could not help but flinch at Kale's sudden action. It was because of what was inside the slightly opened pouch. She could feel large vibrations inside. It was as if the contents were responding to the magic bombs. A large amount of mana could be felt inside the back. Rosalind received the pouch with slightly shaking hands and opened it up. It was a spatial pocket bag. There are hundreds of highest grade magic stones. Rosalind could not breathe for a moment. Just one highest grade magic stone was extremely precious. However, hundreds of them were gathered together and resonating. Use them. Kale walked past her after telling her to use the magic stones. He then walked over to the mages manning the teleportation magic circle. This was the large teleportation magic circle in this base. Does the blinking light mean that the other side is requesting teleportation? Excuse me? Yes, that is correct. Please let them through. Excuse me. But, the mages looked toward Rosalind and the enemies across the gorge. Please hurry. Rosalind nodded her head as Kale asked once more, and the mages activated the teleportation magic circle again. It was at that moment. Boom. 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 The first group had lifted up into the air. Ah. Rosalind could see approximately 100 bears shooting up into the sky. They were flying. The wings only moved a little bit. It didn't seem normal, however, they managed to do their job of keeping the bears up in the air. They were standing in a line and staring as if they were ready to fly toward the Breck Kingdom's forces at any moment. Attack magic and flight magic. She thought of a way to block them. She clenched the pouch in her hand and immediately turned toward the mage brigade. It was now a battle against time. I will help as well. Mary picked up her spatial pocket bag that was full of bones. Rosalind smiled and walked toward the mage brigade. It was at that moment. Pot. The teleportation magic circle flashed. Swoosh the wind brushed by Rosalind and blew toward the source of the light. Rosalind turned her head. Her long red hair fluttered as she saw someone appear. It has been too long. Gashan Nim. The shaman, Gashan. The leader of the tiger tribe had appeared with the tigers. Rosalind could see the wind gathering around Gashan. She stopped walking toward the mage brigade. She then heard Kale's voice again at that moment. Gashan, use your wind incantation. Also, call your crows over. Gashan used the crows as if they were familiars. They had helped quite a bit in order to deliver messages when they had destroyed Arm's fleet over the ocean between the western continent and eastern continent last year. However, there were many other ways to use them as well. Ho ho ho. Do they just need to bother those large crows in the air? Large crows. Gashan's expression was calm as he pointed to the bears. A shaman. Unlike mages, he could directly use the power of nature. The Gorge of Death had the strongest winds in all five of the Forbidden Regions. Gashan revealed his sharp fangs as he could not hide his excitement. At the same time, Kale started to speak to Rosalind. Miss Rosalind, let's move them to the other side. Kale was pointing to the tigers. Rosalind looked toward them as well. Numerous tigers started to appear through the teleportation magic circle. Gur, gur. Their steps became stronger as they walked out of the teleportation magic circle. The tigers were slowly growing after turning berserk. They then started to laugh. They were enjoying Kale saying that he would send them to the location of the enemy. The ally mages and soldiers heard another set of noises as they gulped after seeing the scary expressions on the tigers' faces. Another hundred enemies followed the first group into the air. Boom. Boom. Boom that noise made them miss a different noise. Pot. It was the sound of the teleportation magic circle activating again. However, the mages and Kale noticed it. 
He walked toward the teleportation magic circle. Long time no see. Last night. Kale had contacted someone after learning that Locke was unable to fight. Flick. A strand of water wrapped around the woman's arm. Widira. The future whale queen. Whales were weaker than dragons, but still able to contend with them. At the same time, they were also the strongest in the world other than dragons. Whales. The woman who was the leader of the whales. The humpback whale beast person Widira clenched onto her water whip as she responded back to Kale's greeting with a smile. Young Master Kale, I didn't want to come alone, so they came with me. Young Master Nim, it has been a while. Ahem, it has been a while. It was the half-blooded whale Paston and Archie, the greatest whale warrior. Whittira had brought the two of them with her. Who, who? Kale listened to Rayan's rough breathing coming from behind him as he started to speak to the beast people. The whales and tigers were known to be the most aggressive of the beast people. Kale was not pushing them toward defense as he had done with the others. He saw Choi Han pulling out his sword and told them to do what they did best. Destroy everything. Chapter 237. I will, you, three. Destroy it all. The first people to respond were the ones who were always with Kale. Choi Han. Rosalind called out to Choi Han. At the same time, she clenched one of the highest grade magic stones in her hand. Choi Han started to run toward the cliff's edge. Ung. Um. Mana started to vibrate around Rosalind. Her other hand was busy casting a magic spell. She made a total of five movements. The moment all of her movements ended. Tap, tap, tap. Choi Han kicked off the ground. Rosalind started to smile. She had been the most level-headed one in less than the birth of a hero. Greater than in other words, she had no sense of fear. She was able to throw away her position as a princess and did not put a limit on herself by believing that she could become the tower master of a magic tower. However, level-headed did not mean calm. Her gaze headed toward the enemies. You're all dead. Her hand headed toward Choi Han. Sha wind surrounded Choi Han's body. Flight magic. Rosalind sent Choi Han into the sky and then proceeded with her next actions. Mage Brigades 1, 2, and 3, prepare the strongest attack magic circles. She threw a highest grade magic stone to both the Rhone Kingdom and Breck Kingdom's respective mage captains who were approaching her. There was no hesitation in her movements. The captains caught the highest grade magic stones in shock. The 4th Mage Brigade will create a haste magic circle in order to send our allies to the back. Another highest grade magic stone was thrown to the captain of the 4th Brigade. The Royal Mage's number one disciple, Count Ecross, approached her at that moment. He was the vice captain of the 3rd Mage Brigade. Commander Nim, what about flight magic? The Tiger Tribe, Whale Tribe, and the experts on Kale's side. They needed flight magic in order to send these strong individuals to fight against the bears. Making others flying in the air was not an easy magic to accomplish. You needed to be at least a middle grade mage in order to do that type of magic. I will do it. Excuse me. Rosalind did not even look at Count Ecross as Mana started to appear around her. I can take care of it. Return to the third mage brigade, vice captain. Count Ecross flinched and stepped back. One, two, three. The red mana that flowed out of her body became like threads as they wrapped around her. No, it was as if waves were floating around her. Ecross, you cannot consider Princess Rosalind Nim with regular standards. There is a reason she threw away her position as a princess. Ecross remembered what the Breck Kingdom's royal mage, his master, had told him before. He then looked around. There were numerous mages when they combined the Rhone Kingdom and Breck Kingdom's mages. Ecross had never seen so many battle mages gathered together before. No, he had never seen so many mages gathered together like this at all. It was because there was no magic tower right now. A magic tower. That was a place where hundreds of mages would gather together. However, the current magic tower had fallen. Ecross looked toward Rosalind's back. So many threads of red mana were surrounding her that he could not see her anymore. The woman who was leading the mage brigades seemed as fiery and explosive as her red hair. Ecross. I'm looking forward to Princess Rosalind Nim, no, Mage Rosalind's future. So pay close attention and learn from her during the battle. Master. I think I understand the future that you are looking forward to. Count Ecross turned away from Rosalind. He quickly started to walk to his position. At the same time, 
Rosalind looked toward the person standing next to her and started to smile. Don't worry, young Master Kale, she jokingly added on. I'll make sure to pay you properly for all of the magic stones. I will give you a discount if you buy them in bulk. Rosalind chuckled at Kale's response and closed her eyes before opening them back up and starting to shout. At the same time, the red threads floating around her shot toward a single direction. Please move. The tigers reacted to her shout. The ground rumbled as the large tigers started to move. Shaman Gashin's voice could be heard from within the group of tigers. Oh wind, please bring forth the black wings, Puik. Gashin's staff was stabbed into the ground. They could then hear cawing coming from the distance. Ka, ka, ka. A black cloud seemed to be heading toward them. The black cloud headed toward them with the rising sun on its back. However, the black cloud was not just coming from one direction. Tens, no, hundreds of crows were flying toward them from all directions. Rosalind and Gashan made eye contact. Gashan smiled and started to speak. They will be the ground for the tigers that were able to fly up thanks to your help. These crows would become temporary footholds with the taigas every step in the air. They will also blind the enemies. The crows would gather together in order to prevent the enemies from being able to see. In that moment of temporary blindness, the tigers and Choi Han will strike. Wonderful. I like it. Rosalind nodded her head, closed her eyes and opened up her hands. Shish. The highest grade magic stone floated up as the red mana threads followed her movements to wrap around the taiga's bodies. Rosalind's red hair was glowing red like the rising sun. Boom. 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 The tigers kicked off the ground with force. The red threads sent the tigers up into the air. Plop. The mana threads connected to Rosalind ripped, however, the connection was still there. The red threads surrounded the tigers and slowly became transparent until they became the wind. Kihihi, we meet those bear bastards once again. The tigers split up. They each had to handle tens of bear tribe enemies. It was a one versus many type of situation. However, the tigers could not hide their excitement. You bastards are the tigers that killed our brown bear tribe members. The tigers scoffed at the brown bears that were growling at them. Why are you blaming us when it was your own actions that killed them? Plop. The tigers could feel the crows flying underneath their feet and lending them their bodies. They heard their leader speak from the ground. Run like you were in the mountains. That was Gashin's order. The mountains were where the tigers could be at their strongest. Run as if they were in the mountains. One of the tigers licked his lips. He kicked off the crow underneath his foot. The tiger's white dojo uniform fluttered in the wind. Can you handle over ten of us on your own? The bears moved their wings and rushed toward the tiger that was coming toward them. The tiger started to laugh. How would someone wearing around some obnoxious set of wings defeat a tiger of a mountain? The tigers who had the black ground, crows, and the transparent wind had nothing slowing them down. They were able to easily jump over the bears that were rushing toward them with those uncomfortable wings. They were moving as if they were the ground that was rumbling with an earthquake. The tiger started to move. He then landed behind the bear who was talking to him. The tiger moved his hand and grabbed onto the fake wings. Why, you, eek. The bear struggled, but he could not move very well with the tiger holding onto the wings. However, the rest of the bears rushed toward the tiger at that moment from the north, south, east, west, and above. Anybody could see that the tiger had nowhere to run. You can't go anywhere. You will end up dying here. Ahahaha. The bear with the wings grabbed started to laugh. You bear bastards are so noisy. What? The bear raised his head. He could see the tens of bears rushing toward the tiger, however, the tiger was smiling. The bear that had his wings grabbed suddenly got the chills. The tiger started to speak joyfully. We are on a mountain, a mountain. There are no flat plains on a mountain. The gentle smile seemed vicious because of his fangs. When it comes to a mountain, you have either the top or the bottom. Perhaps? It was the moment the bear's eyes opened wide open. The tiger kicked on the black ground again. He then started to descend. The Gorge of Death. The tiger fell into the darkness of the gorge with a bear in hand. Why, you crazy? The bear felt chills from the wind brushing by his face. He then started to feel fear from the laughter of the tiger behind him. The tiger put some strength into the hands that were holding the large wings. Screech, crack. He ripped the wings apart. 
They were broken. The tiger continued to break the wings as they fell. The bear could see the pieces of the wings falling down underneath him. Pieces of bones and metal. They all started to fall, one by one. And finally, I should save the magic stone though. The magic stone did not fall. Instead, the bear felt a hand starting to choke him. Goodbye. Ah! The bear could not breathe. The bear had not been able to do anything because of the large wings that had hindered him from moving properly. His neck was grasped by the tiger's hand. Ah! Ah! The bear's neck tilted to the side with a groan. He had lost consciousness. The tiger let go of the bear's neck. The bear continued to fall to the ground. However, the tiger took a step forward. Tap. The crows lent him their bodies as footholds. The tiger raised his head. He could see the gazes of the bears looking down at him. He started to smile toward them. All right, let's go up. The tiger casually walked up toward the enemies as if he was walking up a mountain path. There was no fear or hesitation in his walk. But he could see the slightest trace of fear in the eyes of the berserk bears. This is why you bear bastards are useless. Who cares if you are smart? When you can't use your numbers advantage, you are all just cowards. The white dojo uniform's wide sleeves fluttered in the wind. The tiger felt the breeze by his side as he headed back up to the sky. This was the case throughout the area. All of the tigers were roaming through the sky, showing the bears the fear of those who ruled the mountains. Rosalind opened her eyes. She had safely delivered the transparent wind to the tigers. Her eyes were bloodshot. Those bloodshot eyes of hers looked toward a direction. Boom, boom, boom. She was looking at the other side of the cliff. The winged bears who had yet to fly up had changed directions. They were now heading toward her, the location of the Breck Kingdom's forces, instead of the sky. Ung Rosalind looked toward the round container behind the approximately 300 bears running toward her. She heard a mechanical noise as light started to surround the round container. Dwarves with wings were protecting the container along with the enemy mages. Rosalind started to smile again. Boom! She heard the ground rumble again as hundreds of bears started to rush toward her. They were dodging the tiger tribe and the crows while trying to destroy the mage brigades. Rosalind stretched her hands forward and shouted, Three! The ground underneath her feet started to rumble. The robes of the mage brigade's mages fluttered while a group of mages who were standing in a circle around a highest grade magic stone all reached their hands out as well. They could feel the fluctuation of mana in the air. Rosalind was preparing a spell to destroy the wings of the bears flying toward her. Half. I will kill half of those flying bastards in the gorge. Two. Then I need to cast a spell while making sure it doesn't affect the tigers. Rosalind turned her head. She made eye contact with the shaman, Gashan. Ka. Ka. The crows started to create paths. Roots for the attack magic spells to go through were starting to be created one by one. Three for the mage brigades and one for Rosalind. A total of four paths were created. They could see the bears crossing the gorge. We need to first attack the bears and then attack or stop the container. Although it might strain her body, Rosalind planned on using multiple large-scale attack magic spells in a row. Since there were a lot of highest-grade magic stones, she needed to block that container even if it was painful for her to do. She needed to make it stop moving or have it blow up on the enemy side. She bit down on her lips. With that size, it'll be a problem even if it goes off on the other side. The shock from the magic bomb would reach the Breck Kingdom's side as well. However, it was still better than going off on the Breck Kingdom's side. She opened her mouth to speak. 1. The attack would start as soon as she said that word. Oh, Miss Rosalind. She heard someone stopping her at that moment. She could see Kale, as well as people moving behind Kale. Tap, tap. One woman floated up into the sky. Her hair that was blue like the ocean fluttered in the air. At the same time, a large water whip cut through the air. Flick. Huh? Dodge. It's the whale tribe. The bears urgently dodged the whip. However, the whip was not aiming for the bears. The thunderbolt-like whip reached the other side of the gorge of death. Bong. A loud noise was heard as the ground on the other side of the cliff collapsed. In its place was a water whip. However, the whip soon disappeared. Instead, the woman with the whip around her arm used the pull from her whip to land on the other side. Whittira was the first to land in the enemy territory. She picked her whip back up and split the water whip in her hands.
The whip easily divided into two. Widira started to move with a whip in each hand. Rosalind watched this before slowly starting to speak again. 1. The bear tribe's voices filled the area right before she gave the final order. Damn it. Half of you chase the whale. The other half of you, do as we planned. Hurry up. The people leading the bears sped up as they flew toward the Breck Kingdom's forces. The sight of hundreds of wings flying forward like arrows gave them the chills. Miss Rosalind. However, Rosalind could not say anything. Instead, she looked toward Kale, who continued to call her name. It was when the bears were only about 10 meters away from the Breck Kingdom's forces. The Breck Kingdom's people flinched in fear. At the same time, all of the Rhone Kingdom's people's gazes went toward a single person. The person receiving these gazes, Kale, had a silver thread coming out of his hand. At the same time, a loud noise echoed on both sides of the Gorge of Death. Boom! A silver shield appeared and crashed against the bears. Ah! Kale's mouth started to bleed. Rosalind could not understand why Kale was defending her. Bong! Bang! Bong! The bear's wings and Kale's shield continued to crash into each other. Rosalind started to speak. Young Master Kale, you don't even have rayon. The power that always protected Kale's silver shield. Rosalind knew about Rayon's shield. That was why she had watched Kale activating the shield with shaking eyes before urgently speaking. I just need to use attack magic in order to defend against the bears and then find a way to stop that container. It should be possible because we have the whale tribe and the tiger tribe as well. Rosalind could see Kale smiling at that moment. Although he was smiling, he looked as if he was annoyed. Miss Rosalind, I will keep it short. Cough. Black blood started to come out of Kale's mouth again. This made Kale's complexion turn worse, however, nobody else was able to see it due to their fatigue. The whales will not block the container. Neither will the tigers. Just what not block the container? They're not going to stop the magic bombs. Miss Rosalind, you and half of the mage brigade attack the container, while the other half will create shields and prepare to run. Won't the bomb go off? Tens of bombs will explode. The bears were still crashing into the silver shield as they spoke. Rosalind quickly continued to speak after seeing the calm and confident gaze in Kale's eyes. The mages were waiting for her to attack. If the bomb goes off, a bridge will definitely be created. The enemy soldiers will cross over using the rubbles as steps. We will have a lot of casualties because of their numbers. The enemy will not be able to cross, excuse me? Kale made sure Locke and Rayon were still behind him. He then coughed up some more blood and felt much better. He had a smile that would cause Rayon to say, Human, why are you smiling like that? As he quickly tried to forget about the emptiness from Rayon not saying it. He then opened his mouth to speak. He was waiting for the moment the gorge started to shake. The enemy will be met with anger. The dragon's rage will shoot up. Dragon's rage. Ah. Rosalind let out a gasp. She had forgotten about it. Earlier this year, Kale had the tigers plant them inside the gorge. It was a pillar of fire that would reach the heavens. It was a pillar of fire that was multiple grades higher than the one that the alchemist's bell tower has made. The pillars of fire that the ancient dragon Arahaban had created were quietly sleeping underneath the gorge of death. We will start to trick the enemy from here on. Kale's smile was etched in Rosalind's eyes. Chapter 238. I will, you, for, however, although he was smiling, Kale's mind was working faster than ever before. He needed to hurry. Rayon was unable to fight. Kale was someone who always thought about the worst case scenario. He looked down at the video communication device in his hand. It was still connected to Crown Prince Alberu Crossman. Kale started to speak to Alberu, who should have heard his conversation with Rosalind. Your Highness. Ha 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 laughter was coming from the video communication device. Alberu looked at Kale from the other side of the screen. The flame dwarves, their enemies, were trying to destroy one of the five forbidden regions. The gorge of death cut through a portion of the continent. They were trying to destroy that gap between the two portions. Normally, he would be thinking that the enemy was crazy. But it's nothing compared to the bastard who already installed the pillar of fire into the gorge. Alberu had been shocked by Kale's scale before he could be shocked by the enemy's scale. However, he still understood it. Yes. This bastard has always been crazy. He was something who was trying to destroy the gorge of death before the enemy could do it. 
And there was someone who had the same thought that Kale had. And I'm the same. Alberu immediately started to speak. There was no need to listen to Kale anymore. There was a card that the Rhone Kingdom, specifically, Alberu, could put to use after the Pillar of Fire was activated. It was already set in stone. I will make sure it is ready. I will wait for your signal. Stop bleeding every time. You're rich, use some potions or something. I understand, your highness. Rosalind's mouth opened and closed a few times after watching Kale and Alberu casually chat with each other, however, she could not get any words out. Has Crown Prince Alberu always been like this? Furthermore, aren't the two of them too calm? Is it because it is not happening in the Rhone Kingdom? However, Rosalind knew she could not think like that. Kale had been the one who had bled the most until now. Bong. Bang. Bong. The wings continued to bang against the shield. Ah, really. Kale wiped the blood off of his mouth each time as he sent out an even thicker silver strand of light from his hand. The shield was not shaking, even without the help of Rayan's shield. Looks like I don't need to eat more yet. Are you trying to sacrifice yourself? Kale listened to the disappointed Glutton Priestess and the repetitive Super Rock before purposely putting on an expression of struggle. However, there was still calmness in his voice. Miss Rosalind, please hurry. Activate your magic as soon as I give you the signal. Rosalind finally managed to say something. All right. She agreed and turned her head. One of the knights who were waiting near her quickly approached her after seeing her looking at him. Rosalind quickly gave an order to the knight. Kale, who was listening to her give the order, had a look of struggle on his face as he said a few things as well. That made Rosalind start to chuckle. She could manage to laugh even though they were in the middle of a battle. She looked at Kale with an expression that was full of mischief. You're trying to make me use everything I have. Please give me your best, Rosalind. Rosalind cancelled the attack magic spell that were ready to go in her hands. She then moved her hand toward the pouch with the highest grade magic stones. Rosalind. She had become obsessed with magic after seeing the royal mage cast some spells when she was a little girl. She then quickly realized that she was talented in magic. She could feel mana even when she was just standing still. She had decided to bet everything on that feeling. That was why she had taken the courses to become a queen during the day and studied magic all night until she reached a certain level. Finally, she had earned her freedom through magic. Furthermore, she had seen a miracle during that freedom. Dragons. Rayon and Arahaban. Rosalind had focused on each of Arahaban's lessons, as well as the magic that the dragons used. They were using spells that went beyond the limits of human mages. Although she too was human, Rosalind wanted to surpass that limit. I am a very greedy person. Rosalind knew that she was a very greedy person. Why? Because she wanted to surpass the limits of humans. After experiencing that miracle, her goal was to reach that same level before she died. After escaping from a burden called royalty, having a goal of overcoming a giant hurdle was worth challenging for her entire life. Please give me your best, Rosalind. Kale had said that while calling her Rosalind instead of Miss Rosalind. She decided to follow the words of the only person to realize her greed. Forget Arahabin Nim, my current skills are not even enough to reach the level of Rayan's paws. However, you did not need to follow the standard procedures all the time. Klong. The sound of stones clanging against each other could be heard in her hand. Her hand that was inside the bag of magic stones came back out. She then started to take out magic stone after magic stone. She turned around after holding tens of magic stones in her hands. She then headed toward the mage brigade. I'll be waiting for you. Kale nodded his head at Rosalind's statement before he looked toward the front. Why, young master Nim? Stay behind me. Yes, yes sir. Locke bit down on his lips after seeing Rosalind with bloodshot eyes in a different atmosphere than usual, the bloodied Kale, and the sick Rayon in his arms. Boom. 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 Locke's heart started to beat faster and stronger. Fear and concern about the battle. The tall Locke's body could not be covered by the shorter Kale's back. That was why he could see the beings that were crashing into Kale's shield. Furthermore, he could also see the tigers and Choi Han in the sky. They look to be in dangerous situations. Stop paying attention to useless things. Focus on your tasks. Locke's shoulders flinched at Kale's comment. My tasks. His tasks were to be behind Kale and to hold Rayon. Locke did not look at anything else other than Kale's back. He held onto Rayon a little tighter. 
Boom. 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 Locke could hear his heart beating loudly even in the middle of the deafening battle. He was slowly realizing it. It was happening from deep inside his heart. The feeling was slowly rising up from there. Fear and concern. An emotion different than those was rising up as if it would eat up his wildly beating heart. Locke's eyes started to turn red as he watched Kale's back. Kale did not know about this as he poured more power into the shield. He was frowning so much and he did not seem to be doing well. Kihihi. Yes, keep defending like that. The bears ruthlessly rammed into the shield as they continued to laugh. Their goal was to stall for time anyway. That was why they were actually thankful that Kale had used his shield to help them stall for time. Your face looks hilarious. The bears could see Kale's neck and uniform becoming wet from his blood. They could also see the serious frown on his face. Of course, Kale was just acting. He was also not wiping the blood off on purpose. He was much better now than when he was bleeding from every orifice during the battle at the Henatus territory. But the enemy had no way of knowing about this. However, the hundreds of bears in the sky were not just calm. It is not breaking easily. The shield was sturdy as expected. It only shook for a moment, even when hundreds of wings slammed into it. It was similar to a castle wall that was trying to stay firm no matter what. Will it block the bomb as well? Some of the bears suddenly got the chills. Although it was not likely, the fact that Kale had defeated the dragon half-blood made the bears from Arm think about the, what-ifs. Of course, Kale had no plan on being a castle wall or keeping this up for a long time. He was just going to stall for time until he reached his limits before making a run for it. The bears who did not know this were thinking that Kale might persist until the end. Some of the bears raised their voices to order their subordinates. Make sure to block the whales no matter what, boom, boom. The bears who were flying landed back on the ground. Flame dwarves, bears, and knights got in the way of three individuals. They were naturally the three whales. It was difficult for bears to defeat whales. Whether it was in weight or strength, they were no match for the whales. However, the bears seemed relaxed compared to the hesitating knights and soldiers of the Indomitable Alliance. The bears quickly shouted the reason that they were relaxed. We are not afraid of whales that cannot go berserk. Bears lived on land. Whales lived in the ocean. That difference was preventing the whales from going berserk. Whales needed water in order to go berserk. Not a small amount of water made from magic, but large quantities of water, such as during a hail, to go berserk. The whales were strong. However, although the whales that could not go berserk made the bears feel fear, they were not in despair. Ha ha ha. The bears could hear the killer whale Archie starting to laugh at that moment. He then slammed his fists against each other. Bang. The sound of bear fist slamming was chilling. Archie's gaze headed toward the hundreds of flame dwarves, bears, and knights in his way. It feels terrible to be ignored by a stupid bear. Archie was known for being a whale with a terrible personality. He leaned on one foot and frowned as he started to speak. You useless idiots. That was all he said. Then he started to move. Archie moved quickly toward the enemies. However, there was someone who was moving even faster than him. Archie sighed while looking at the water whip that was brushing past him. Some people have said that he has a bad personality, however, in Archie's opinion, the royal humpback whale beast people were even worse. Bong. The areas that the two water whips went through ended up destroyed as if a sword master's aura had cut through the area. The shocked knights of the Indomitable Alliance moved back while the mages activated shields in front of the large container. Defend it no matter what it takes, just three more minutes. One of the flame dwarves shouted as loudly as possible. Ung light started to fill up the container even more. Steam then started to appear from the large container with the magic bombs. Two large containers were pointed at the same spot. They were pointed toward the Breck Kingdom, specifically, the shield on their side. Three minutes. It was a short yet long duration of time. See as they could hear things starting to burn. The knights of the Indomitable Alliance looked toward the water whips. The whips that had split into two were being held by the bears. Ugh. Whales were the strongest of the beast people. The bears who were holding onto the whip of the future whale queen felt as if their palms were being cut by a blade, but they continued to hold on. Gur, gur. The rough breathing of the berserk bears could be heard as they held onto Whittier's whips for dear life. However, someone suddenly appeared between them. To be specific, 
the person fell onto the bears' heads. The bears immediately let go of the whips and stepped back. Boom. The ground broke as if it was a window from Archie's fist. At the same time, Paston's sword used that opening to attack the bears. Two minutes. The pupils of the flame dwarf that was shouting the time remaining were shaking. Whittira was running toward him in a straight line. Bang, bang. When he looked up, the black-haired swordmaster who used black aura was freely flying in the air with the help of the crows as he killed bear after bear. Reap reap. The wings were ripped. Kahahaha. The tigers were laughing even though they showed signs of being scratched by the bear's claws. The tigers did not care that their white dojo uniforms were being stained with blood as they rushed toward the bears. They made sure to grab onto a bear and rip their wings off to make them fall into the gorge. The flame dwarf bit down on his lips. They truly were strong. There were too many strong individuals on the enemy side. However, all of this only worked for short battles. Longer battles would always be won by the side with overwhelming numbers. In that case, they just needed to make as long a battle as possible. They needed to destroy the Gorge of Death. One more minute. The Flame Dwarf shouted once again. The knights stepped back at that moment. The knights and beginner mages retreated backward, even with the whales rushing toward them. Instead, the ones with the wings blocked against the whales with all they had. The berserk bears were using their numbers to barely hold off the three whales. The Flame Dwarfs put on their wings and started to fly. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. The dwarf calling out the time prepared to fly up and look to the other side. Kale Henetus. Number one on the Indomitable Alliance's kill list. He could see Kale barely holding the bears off with his shield. He had already defended against the bears for five minutes. It was shocking. However, it would be difficult for him to defend against these bombs. It was because his shield was not large enough to defend the entire gorge. The gorge of death was much larger than Castle Leona. They just needed to destroy one spot. Then the enemy would fall. 10. The flame dwarf called out as he started to move his wings. Ung. Um. He could feel the container starting to shake underneath his feet. A heat as hot as what he felt when blacksmithing crawled up his legs. Block it. Activate the defensive magic circles. The flame dwarf could see the movement of Kale's lips. Kale was shouting louder than ever. The flame dwarf scoffed. Two of the containers were directed toward Kale's shield. 3. The bears who were fighting against the whales kicked off the ground. One of the bears mocked the whales as he flew up. It looks like you're not so great when you can't go berserk. 2. The flame dwarf's voice could be heard. There should be an explosion in one second now. The bear who had mocked their ways suddenly flinched. He could see the whales smiling as he kicked off the ground and flew up. What the, he could see the shape of Whittier's mouth. It's not enough, not enough. What is not enough? He then saw the whales jumping into the air. They were moving very quickly. They were stepping on crows and using Gashin's wind in order to head up into the sky. The tigers and Choi Han also quickly headed up to the sky. The hundreds of crows all headed up into the sky as well. Higher and higher. They kept going higher without looking back. The flame dwarf calling the numbers out from above the container kicked off into the air. 1. Screech, boom. The direction of the two containers changed. The containers that were pointed at the shield were now pointed underneath it. They were headed toward the cliffs that were supporting the Breck Kingdom's forces. The flame dwarf and the middle grade mages who were near the containers all flew up into the sky. Ooh, the containers started to make noises. Extreme heat was coming out of them as well. Finally, light shot out from the two large containers. Destroy it, destroy it. The flame dwarves cheered while looking at the containers. Tens of strands of white light came out of the containers. The numerous magic bombs all poured out toward the cliff. Kahaha, a bridge will end up being created no matter how much you defend. The cliffs would fall from the explosions. The soldiers of the Indomitable Alliance were already far away, outside of the bomb's range. The Flame Dwarf tribe cheered while watching the tens of white light shooting out of the container. It was at that moment, Shaw the Silver Shield disappeared. At the same time, Kale wiped the blood off of his mouth and said a single word. Attack. Locke's body started to quickly move following behind Kale. The sound of the wind was roaming around Kale's feet. Locke heard the ground rumbling at that moment. Ung. Um. 
Another loud noise shook the Breck Kingdom's forces. They could see the tens of white light shooting down. One woman reached her hand out toward the lights that held the magic stones inside them. Tens of mages from two mage brigades were behind her with their hands on the magic circle. Tens of highest grade magic stones created a circle around Rosalind, who was standing at the center of the magic circle. Drip. Rosalind ignored the blood at the corner of her lips as she started to smile. Fire, stretch forth. Ooh a large fire shot out from the magic circle. A fire that looked as if the sun had descended shot forward. To be specific, they were heading toward the tens of white light. What the, what the, why are they attacking? It will be destroyed. The flamed dwarves and bears shouted and noticed the enemies rushing past them and into the air. Choi Han, the tigers, and the whales. They were continuing to move higher up along with the crows and the wind. They continued to head higher up, as if that was the only way to survive. Just what the flame dwarves suddenly got the chills and looked down. The white light and the large fire crashed. Bong. The gorge of death. A loud noise that seemed to be orchestrating death echoed in the area. Ha 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 ha. What do you think, young master Kale? Rosalind laughed out loud even with blood on the corners of her lips. She looked toward Kale, who was carrying her and running. Kale used more of the sound of the wind as he pointed behind him. Rosalind raised her head to see what was going on. A large explosion. There was a mix of the white light and the red flames. She then felt the vibrations of the ground. The gorge of death was going to be destroyed. They could not avoid it. However, something that ate up that light appeared from underneath the gorge. Kale stopped moving once he reached the safe zone, he then turned around. He looked toward where the white and red lights had disappeared. He looked toward where the cliff was breaking. Fire was shooting up from deep underneath the gorge of death. Kale recalled a conversation between the ancient dragon, Arahaban, and the young dragon, Rayon. What color should we make it? Little kid, what color do you like? You mean for the fire? Yes. I am greater than the alchemists, so I can easily change the color of the flame as I wish. The natural powers of fire will not change just because you change the color. Goldie, then make it the majestic black color. It is majestic because it is my color. I don't want to. I'm going to do whatever I want, little kid. Bong. 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 The orbs with the liquid fire started to explode. A large fire absorbed the white and red lights, the gorge of death. It appeared as if death was descending on the gorge. The dark blue fire started to absorb everything else. Ha ha ha. Kale started to laugh. The dark blue fire shot up into the sky as if it wanted to eat up the sky as well. The fire that was the same color as Rayan's eyes started to dominate the gorge. Dragon's Rage. The battle was only just beginning. Chapter 239. I will, you, five. Originally, the gorge of death should have been destroyed from the magic bombs coming out of the large containers. Boom the cliffs started to break apart. The broken pieces started to fill up the deep gorge. H. How is this? The Knights of the Indomitable Alliance urgently got off of their horses after feeling a rumbling that was beyond what they had expected. They were clutching onto their reins, however, they did not even notice this action as they were at a loss for words while watching what was happening in front of them. This was the same for the people on the Breck Kingdom's side as well. The soldiers who had been running away from the magic bombs quickly got back up after having fallen from the shock of the explosion. That is from our side, the soldiers could not help but shake at what their allies had done. Their gazes all headed to a single direction as they got back up. They were all looking at Kale and his group. They were the only ones who were looking at this explosion with calm expressions. It was just one part of the gorge of death that was hundreds of kilometers long. Those few kilometers of the gorge were filled with rock and dirt. The Indomitable Alliance's plan succeeded. Rosalind started to laugh even though the enemy's plan had worked. Why? It was because she could see a wall of dark blue fire gulping up the broken area of the cliffs. The dark blue flames glowed in Rosalind's red pupils. Dragons really are amazing. Although her insides were not well because of her overuse of mana, she could not stop laughing. She heard a quiet voice by her ear at that moment. Miss Rosalind, I'm going to let you down now. Rosalind flinched. She was still being carried over Kale's shoulders. She slightly turned her head. She could see that Kale's arm was shaking. Ah, this weak person was, realizing that she was being carried by this weak person, Rosalind felt extremely sorry. 
she quickly got off of Kale's shoulder. She then looked toward him, expecting to see him frowning from being tired, she then flinched again. His extremely calm face was looking toward the dark blue wall of fire. The bridge was blocked. The gorge of death spanned hundreds of kilometers. The enemy's bridge that should have appeared in the middle of the gorge became useless because of the dark blue wall of fire. Of course, the enemy may try to do the same thing at the other cliffs around the gorge of death. However, the dragon's rages that were installed throughout the cliffs would block them each time. Miss Rosalind. Yes, young Master Kale. Now the Mage Brigade can slowly take down the enemies in the sky. Rosalind was already giving orders to the Mage Brigade with her hands and having them prepare long-distance attack magic spells. She continued to speak with a much more relaxed disposition. Have the knights and soldiers line up against the cliffs so that we can detect and prevent the enemies from attempting to do the same thing again. It was now going to be a prolonged battle. Kale's group managed to block the enemy's path, however, it also meant that the Breck Kingdom's side could only attack the other side with magic as well. Although they had strong individuals with them, there were not enough of them to handle hundreds of thousands of enemy soldiers. Furthermore, Rosalind wanted to win while having the least number of casualties as possible. The enemy will end up retreating in a prolonged battle due to a lack of supplies. The North always has a shortage of food in springtime. The Breck Kingdom does not have such issues. We cannot allow that. Excuse me? A rare stern voice answered back. We cannot let it become a prolonged battle, young Master Kale? Rosalind's heart started to beat faster again. Kale had a relaxed expression on his face, however, there was nervousness in his eyes now. Nervousness. It was a word that did not fit well with Kale. That was why Rosalind was getting worried as well. At that moment, Kale turned away from the dark blue pillar of fire. We need to quickly take care of them. Kale's battle was only just beginning. It was a fight against time from here on. Kale could not stop fighting because of a certain individual. It was someone Rosalind had heard about but not experienced herself. But Kale had experienced his strength before. Kale called forward someone who had been preparing ever since earlier. Mary. The black robe moved toward Kale. The sky had turned dark as night was approaching, now only being lit up by the dark blue light of the wall of fire. That made Kale's red hair stand out. Those things over there. Mary looked toward where Kale was pointing. He was pointing at the winged individuals that were floating around the pillar of fire looking concerned. Kale gave the order as soon as she looked toward those winged individuals. Get rid of them. Get rid of all of them. Mary, those wings have skeletons on them as well. Ah. Mary let out a gasp. Rosalind was also shocked as she looked at Kale. Dead wyvern's bones. A necromancer who can make skeletons move. It was the moment an image was created in Rosalind's mind. The necromancer underneath the black hood started to smile. I understand. Her mechanical voice echoed in the area. At the same time, black threads started to come out of Mary's hands. Flap, flap. A black bone wyvern flapped its wings, it then kicked off the ground and flew up. Kale lifted his head up. Someone fell down from high in the sky and toward the flying black wyvern. Tap. The wyvern's body lightly shook. However, the person who landed on top of it did not shake at all. Choi Han, the black-haired swordmaster, grabbed onto the wyvern's neckbone as they headed back up next to the dark blue fire. A group of crows flew next to him. The hundreds of crows had created a black road in the sky. It was as if they were creating new ground in the air. One of those crows landed on Choi Han's shoulder. It then opened its mouth and a familiar voice could be heard. This is Kale Nim's order. It was the voice of the tiger shaman, Gashan. The crow was a familiar that was delivering its master's voice. And there was more than one familiar. The tigers in their white dojo uniforms were high up in the air looking down at the dark blue wall of fire. The crows also gave an order to these tigers who were patching up some light wounds. The enemy's wings are all remains of the dead. Destroy all of the wings. Remains of the dead. The tigers properly understood the meaning behind those words. Their gazes headed toward Choi Han and the black wyvern that were flying back up. Ka, ka. The black birds that delivered the orders started to ride the wind and move again. Choi Han followed their movements and flew up before taking out his sword. Clang. Black aura came out of it. Choi Han could see some people moving by him and going down. The three whales smiled at Choi Han before heading toward the ground. 
he could hear the voice of the killer whale, Archie. A fire made by a dragon is a bit difficult for us. We will take care of the ground. Choi Han responded with a short nod before moving even faster up into the sky. Archie shook his head at Choi Han's vicious appearance. That guy is not normal either. He heard a loud noise as he had that thought. Bang. The black aura cut through the air. Ah. The flame dwarves' bodies were pushed back. They all looked down at the weapons in their hands. The weapons that were slashed by the aura broke into pieces and fell down. Crackle. The pieces were then gobbled up by the dark blue wall of fire. The black aura was scary, but the flame dwarves were more scared of that wall of fire. How? How could there be such a fire? A flame dwarf who was holding now just the handle of an axe subconsciously gulped. Their plan had failed. There was a fire where there should have been a bridge. As they were the flame dwarf tribe, they could feel the fierceness of the fire extremely well. Could there be a human who could create a liquid that was filled with such a pure power as this? The flame dwarves were surrounded by an unknown sense of fear. No, it was actually a fear that they knew about. They knew that neither humans, dwarves, beast people, nor elves could create such a pure fire. The existence that could create this fire was someone the flame dwarves feared. However, they could not withdraw. Number we need to do it on our own. We can't live under someone else's rule forever. In order to overcome their fear, in order to escape from someone else's rule, the flame dwarf tribe had already done things that they shouldn't do. They controlled their wings to move again. However, they could not hide the fact that they were shaking in fear. There were less than 30 tigers in the Swordmaster. On the other hand, there were still hundreds of people from the Indomitable Alliance flying in the air. There were still beings that were guarding the flame dwarves. Bong. The bears clashed against Choi Han. You crazy bastards. A pillar of fire. Are you planning on setting the entire gorge of death on fire? One of the bears shouted at Choi Han as he quickly looked around. The flame dwarves seemed to be in shock from the pillar of fire and the ineffectiveness of the magic bombs. This is why slave bastards can never change. The bears were looking at the flame dwarf tribe as if they were trash for claiming that they could get this done but were now being scared. The tigers were bleeding, but continued to take down the bears one by one. Crazy bastards, the bear bit down on his lips. There would be the lion tribe on the eastern continent and the bear tribe on the western continent. That was the deal that made them take out the western continent's wolf tribe and the eastern continent's tiger tribe, but how could things get messed up like this? They are also in cahoots with the whale tribe. They were planning on giving the ocean to the mermaids and using them to arm's advantage, however, the whales had messed it all up. He should have known things would go weird as soon as they appeared. However, the bears that finally figured out the flow of things could not stop. The video communication device on his waist shined and delivered the bear tribe's ruler's orders. Fight. Persist. The smart bears could not go against their ruler's orders. He was a mid-level administrator, so they had to listen as he raised his voice and commanded them. Kill the crows first. Make it so that the tigers cannot move freely. A loud noise reached their ears at that moment. Bong. The bear looked to the front. He could see his subordinates fighting against Choi Han's black aura. Crazy bastard. The black aura that was shooting up into the sky was similar to the dark blue wall of fire. Contrary to the swordmaster's gentle-looking face. The black aura was violent and chaotic. The swordmaster seemed to be purposely letting the aura run wild. He may look gentle, but you can't judge a book by its cover. The bear lightly tapped his fists together. Tang. He could hear the noise of his gauntlets clanking. At the same time, his wings started to move. He rushed toward the center of the battlefield. Bong. His gauntlet smashed into a portion of Wyvern's wing bone. The bear turned his head in order to look at Choi Han. The two of them made eye contact. He smiled at Choi Han before ordering the nearby bears. Destroy the wyvern. It was an airborne battle. The tigers and the swordmaster were in the same boat. They just needed to get rid of their rides. The bear could see Choi Han lightly biting down on his lips. This must be the right method. The bear's eyes became cloudy as he dodged a black aura coming his way. Ah. The aura was fast. However, the bears continued to hit the wyvern's body at that moment. Boom, boom. Bang. The wyvern skeleton raised its claws and tried to slash at the nearby bears each time. However, it was too slow. 
The wyvern's claws could not touch the bears other than leaving light scratches on their wings. Kahahaha. You think wings made of metal and bones will break by those stupid claws? The bear laughed at what the necromancer on the ground was doing in order to try to protect the wyvern. However, her actions made the black haired sword master unable to regain his balance and stumble. It was a two for one deal for the bears. Who cares if you can use aura? I just need to dodge. The bear dodged Choi Han's aura once more. Yes, the place that this swordmaster had shown his strength until now was the ground. Well, sometimes the water as well, however, it was never the sky. Although that swordmaster had fought against the dead guardian knight, Klopa, that was when he was riding a dead dragon's bones and not a black wyvern's bones. We are able to move more freely in the air. The bear was certain about this, and this certainty led to a change in his actions. Boom, bang. The wyvern shook. Choi Han could not even use his sword properly because of the shaking, nor could he block the enemy's attacks. Ah. Uh. Choi Han let out a groan. The wyvern continued to twist its body and scratch at the bears with its claws. However, the claws still could not touch the bears other than leaving light scratches. Ha ha ha. How fun. I will throw you and the wyvern into the fire that your allies created. The bear was smiling to the point that his fangs were showing. I'm not so sure about that. The bear could hear Choi Han's voice at that moment. At the same time, Mary quietly said something on the ground as well. It's ready. Black light started to come out of the black wyvern's empty eye sockets. Chapter 240. I will, you, six. The light flowed down the black bones and started to spread throughout the wyvern's body. At the same time, black threads started to come out of the wyvern's body. Swish, swish. The sticky black threads started to shoot out at fast speeds. What the? Why is it suddenly black? The bears flinched at the sudden change. The bears' bodies suddenly swerved at that moment. Huh? The swerving bear's gaze went toward his wings. One of his wings was tilting. The wing that was scratched by the wyvern's claw. Those scratches started to become dyed black. The mid-level administrator bear subconsciously looked toward Choi Han when that happened. The sword master who was standing calmly and balanced started to speak. You can't stick dead bones in front of a necromancer. Crack. The metal connecting the different bones of the wings started to break. Huh, huh? There was a simple reason for it. The bones that were connected by the black threads were starting to move on their own. Those sudden movements made the connecting joints made of metal break apart. In the end, the bones became free from the rest of the wings. Screech, clunk. Clunk. Those bones followed the black threads and gathered together. Click. Click. The white bones started to gather on top of the black wyvern as if they were gears fitting together. The wyvern's body started to grow in size. N. No. The corners of the bear's lips were shaking. However, he could not stand still. M, my wings. The wings of the bear that had the most wyvern scratches had suddenly lost about 50% of its bones. The bear administrator's subordinate's body started to tilt. Fall. Only falling was left for those who had lost their wings. They would fall directly into the dark blue fire. The bear administrator quickly started to move. He reached out his hand. He was trying to catch his subordinate before he fell into the dark blue fire. However, he could not approach the bear. Slosh. The black aura cut between himself and his subordinate. Ah. The bear grabbed his hand that was cut by the aura. Once he turned his head, he could see that Choi Han's chilly gaze was directed toward him. He heard his subordinate scream at that moment. Ah. It was the sound of him falling. Although they had not fought properly, the subordinate who had lost his wings instantly fell to his death. He was not the only one. There were more bears that had rushed toward the wyvern and had their wings scratched by it. All of their bodies started to tilt. The tens of bears who had rushed toward the wyvern all fell into the dark blue fire. Click. Click. The bones continued to gather together in order to make the black wyvern larger at the same time. The person who was standing on top of that wyvern's head. That person's violent aura was directed at the bear administrator. The administrator could only watch his falling subordinates. The bears who had lost their wings to the tigers all fell as well. Screams and fire. Choi Han started to move once fear filled the air. His gaze was directed toward the bears and the flame dwarves. 
With both Rayon and Locke out of commission, it was his duty to kill the enemies. He could see the scared individuals. Choi Han was only aiming for the leaders among them. The bear administrator retreated to the back. Boom, boom. The other bears tried to get in his way as he chased after the administrator, however, Choi Han and the wyvern ignored them and pushed forward. The violent black aura cut through the wings while the wyvern opened its mouth in order to rip the wings off of the bears with bites. The wyvern that was wearing a white skeleton armor had nothing to fear. Reap another wing was ripped off and the original owner of the wing fell while screaming. Damn it. The bear administrator could not believe how Choi Han and the wyvern managed to kill all of his subordinates on their way to him. He had flown until he got to where the flame dwarves were gathered together. The frightened flame dwarves could be seen taking out their weapons in fear. Although he would normally curse these cowards who could not even run away, he could not do so right now. Shaw. The black aura brushed by his side again. He might die. The bear felt a sense of fear. There were no obstacles in the air. That was why there was nowhere to escape when someone was chasing after you. Do I need to go back to the ground? However, the king had given an order. He told them to fight. He told them to persist. But for how long? The bear's mind was currently chaotic. His tribe members and subordinates were falling into the wall of fire, however, he did not want to fall in there himself. Shit, shit, he continued to swear. It was at that moment. He is heading over. He heard the king's message. The bear administrator stopped moving. Choi Han who was following behind the bear administrator did not wonder why the bear had suddenly stopped as he swung his sword right away. However, something happened before the black aura could hit the bear. Kahahaha. He's finally here. The bear's dirty laugh stuck to Choi Han's ears. At the same time, Choi Han suddenly got the chills. A sense of danger. In other words, the instincts of a weakling who has met a strong enemy. Choi Han, who realized the identity of this chill, immediately grabbed onto the wyvern's neck and shouted at it. Return. We need to return. He's here. Choi Han had a good idea about who this bear was respectfully talking about. The wyvern and Choi Han urgently changed directions. They started to fly toward a single direction. Locke, Rayon, and Kale. They were flying toward where the weakest members of their group were currently located. A quiet noise was caught by Choi Han's senses as he cut through the wind in order to head to the ground. Pot. It was the sound of a magic spell being cast. He also felt an existence that caused his instincts to tell him that it was dangerous. Choi Han, who had come down to the center of the pillar of fire, looked up. The dark blue wall of fire. Someone appeared on top of that wall. The dragon half-blood. The man with white gold hair and a pale expression had a smile on his face as he appeared on the battlefield. Kale started to frown after seeing that the dragon half-blood had appeared. Fuck. The reason that he needed to quickly end this battle. The reason that they needed to kill as many of the enemies as possible. Kale Henatus, is it him? He could hear Crown Prince Alberu's voice through the video communication device. Yes sir. I'm hanging up now. What? Kale ended the call. He then passed the video communication device over to Rosalyn and called out some coordinates. Miss Rosalyn, please connect it. Young Master Kale, that, that person. Rosalyn's expression became serious. As a genius mage, she could feel the strength of the dragon half-blood better than anybody else. Why? It's been a while. It was because the dragon half-blood was not hiding his strength right now. Rosalyn was a human who had watched Arahabin teach Rayon. The unique aura of a dragon that was revealing its presence, the vibration of the mana could be felt from that person. Her lips started to dry up quickly. She heard Kale's voice at that moment. It was extremely clear, as if telling her to snap out of it. Miss Rosalyn, hurry, it is our lifeline, lifeline. Rosalyn knew exactly who Kale was trying to call. She started to connect the call with shaking hands. Kale was looking at the dragon half-blood mage that was floating in the air as she did that. The dragon half-blood seemed to be extremely amused. I didn't think you'd prepare such a wall of fire. He felt the strength of a higher being coming from the dark blue fire. He licked his lips and looked down at Kale. He was originally not planning to come here. Those stupid flame dwarves threw a fit about how they would take care of it. However, he had come after receiving an urgent request for help. But he was satisfied after coming here. The wall of fire and a face that he had not seen in a while. 
A person who was similar to himself. He looked at the person who was similar to him and used amplification magic in order to speak. Wow. You know how to make things like this too, little bro. Little bro. Those words made Kale start to frown. Crazy bastard. When did I ever become your little brother? And why are you saying such a thing so loudly? However, Kale could not respond before slowly starting to move. The wolf boy, Locke, flinched. It was because he saw Kale coming toward him. It was at that moment. Number, the dragon half-blood mumbled quietly. The dragon half-blood's quiet voice could not reach the others without amplification magic. However, Locke could see the dragon half-blood pointing with his finger. He was pointing at Locke. No, he was pointing at the bundle of blankets in Locke's arm. Who, who? The young dragon was still breathing heavily. You're not my little bro. You're just a human. That is the dragon. The dragon half-blood's eyes started to sparkle. He could feel the strength of the plate inside of that small blanket. The vibrations that he was feeling were what happened when a dragon was creating its plate. Although he had only felt half of it, he too had felt it before. The dragon half-blood started to smirk. The first growth phase. He used amplification magic in order to speak again and his voice echoed throughout the area. However, he was speaking to Kale. What a perfect time to kill him, no. He really wanted to kill it if it was a real dragon. Half-bloods like him that had useless blood mixed inside always hated the full bloods. The corners of the dragon half-blood's lips started to curl up even higher. Locke subconsciously hugged Rayon even tighter after seeing that. However, Rayon was still unconscious and breathing heavily. Locke. Locke could see someone's back in front of him. It was Kale. From this moment, you were to look at my back and only my back, no matter what. Kale looked toward the dragon half-blood. He he he, this is really fun. He could see the dragon half-blood laughing. Kale looked around. Locke, who was behind his back, was unable to fight. Rosalind had overused her powers to the point that she was bleeding. Mary and Choi Han were fine, but they were not as strong as the dragon half-blood. The tigers were injured as well and were having enough trouble dealing with the bears. That meant that there was only one option left. Kale could see the people approaching him. Young Master Kale. That person is, Whittira closed her mouth after seeing Kale put his hand on her shoulder. Whittira. Whales need water in order to go berserk, right? It is impossible with a small amount of water made from magic. Whales were creatures of the ocean. It was only natural that they needed water in order to go berserk and that the amount of pure water they needed was impossible to fill with magic. Of course, they could create a significant amount of water with magic, however, Whittier's expression did not look good after taking a look around. Miss Rosalind is weakened right now, and the Breck Kingdom's mages have a limit to their powers. Crackle, crackle. Kale looked at the orbs of light being created around the dragon half-blood mage and started to think. He needed someone who could fight against the dragon half-blood. Even as a half-blood, he still had the strength to rival a dragon. The whales were the only ones who could fight with such an existence. But it would be difficult for Paston, the half-blooded whale. Whittira and Archie. The future whale queen and the current strongest warrior of the whale tribe. He needed them. But they were not enough. His gaze headed toward the destroyed cliff in the wall of fire underneath the dragon half-blood. It was not enough with a small amount of water created by magic. In that case, is a tsunami the width of that destroyed cliff and height of the wall of fire enough? Will you be able to go berserk even for just a little bit? A tsunami the height of that wall of fire. Whittira thought about the wall of fire that was multiple kilometers long. If it was that much pure water. It will be worth trying. She could see Kale starting to smile while looking at the wall of fire. Someone who could persist against the dragon half-blood. He needed a battlefield for them to run wild. Kale slowly grabbed the necklace around his neck. He needed to use what was inside this jewel. The dominating water. It was made of pure water and was a perfect match for the whales who were the rulers of the ocean. This was the only method. He looked toward Whittira and started to speak. I will create a tsunami for you, 